So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next edition of the Make Your Mark Knowledge Share event series being brought to you on International Volunteer Managers Day as part of the COP26 Culture at COP online event programme. Climate change has been increasingly brought to our attention over the previous years, but COP26 has really accelerated awareness that we need to work together to embrace the shifts in behaviours that affect us all. So we all need to understand these shifts in different ways and respect and support each other with our different needs and skills. There's a real opportunity to turn the volunteering responses into one of the solutions. So today we'll be exploring and discussing the relationships that volunteering can have with climate change. So my name is Rosie Wiley. I'm from Historic Environment Scotland and I'm on the board with Volunteer Scotland and I will be your chair for the day. On behalf of the organising committee, I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers, workshop presenters and panel members. And of course, to all of you who have signed to be part of this knowledge share and discussion today. This event is brought to you by a partnership between Make Your Mark and the Heritage Volunteer Group and is hosted by Historic Environment Scotland's Community Connections Forum. These are a collaboration of organisations coming together who all share the same aspiration for supporting volunteer involving organisations and championing an excellent and inclusive volunteer experience. The Make Your Mark campaign aims to increase the number and diversity of heritage volunteers in Scotland. Our goal is to encourage the heritage sector to take the lead on inclusive volunteering practice and experiences. We currently have 51 organisations signed up and Erin Burke will tell you more about joining Make Your Mark later in the event. The Heritage Volunteering Group was set up in 2014 and exists to promote volunteering, champion the best practice and connect practitioners in heritage volunteering across the UK. They seek to support all volunteer involving heritage organisations from natural to the built environment, ranging from volunteer led organisations to independent regional or national museums, trusts and groups. I just want to run through a few housekeeping rules before we welcome our first speaker. We are in a Zoom meeting format, which will hopefully enable you to fully participate in the chat and discussion. Please do keep your mics off unless you're speaking or this will cause feedback for our presenters. Please keep cameras off if that improves your connection to hopefully ensure that we have a smooth running order for today. After each talk, we'll have a live question and answer session. You can use the chat feature, which can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen in the centre, to pose your questions or comments, which will be picked up by Susan. Please start your question with a cue so that Susan can easily identify it as a question to be asked. These instructions will also be added to the chat bar. Before the first break, I will introduce Vanessa, who's going to share a tool called Mentimeter. This will be optional to use, but if you do choose to use it, it will allow you to pose questions and vote on questions submitted by others, and we'll be using that for the panel discussion as the event progresses. The panel will be made up from today's speakers, and they will also be joined by Rob Jackson, Director of Rob Jackson Consulting, and Vanessa Theed, Volunteer and Apprenticeship Strategy Manager from the Natural History Museum and Vice Chair of the Heritage Volunteering Group. I know I don't need to say to this to you all, but please be kind and respectful when you ask your questions or take part in the discussions. As I have said, if we're in any doubt, we'll remove you and put you back in the waiting room. We really want to make sure that this is a friendly and inclusive event that attracts you all to attend again. We are of course tweeting. Our event hashtag is hashtag make your mark Scott. These will be popped in the chat. So please do tweet away. Let's also see if we can make the screen a colourful one by making the most of the, re the reactions icons that can be found next to the chat function along the bottom on the right hand side. So let's have a little moment to practice now. So please do, everyone do a little reaction. I'm going to do a wee heart. So you can see the reactions along the bottom. There we go. Nice colourful. Some clapping hands, thumbs up. Wonderful. So please do use these reactions as the event continues and um, to let us know how you're feeling um, within the presentations, reactions to questions and answers and such like. So we're going to get started then. So to the open the event, we have a film about supporting sustainability through culture and heritage featuring Gemma Lawrence from Creative Carbon Scotland. Gemma couldn't be with us today, but Gemma is the cultural shift manager at Creative Carbon Scotland which is a national charity in Scotland that connects arts and sustainability. 
They work to reduce cultural sectors, environmental impact and explore its creative influential potential in wider society. In her presentation, Gemma will define sustainable development and climate justice, and then she'll share a few case studies to show the role that culture and heritage can play in, in addressing climate change. Although not directly focusing on volunteering, we thought that this presentation would be a great way to set the scene and get us all thinking about the ties between climate change and heritage. So I'll pass over to Rosie B, who's going to play the film. Thank you. So, um, yes, hello everyone. And a big thank you to Erin and the Volunteer Organisers Network for inviting me to be part of today's event. It's, it's great to be here. As Rebecca said, my name is Gemma Lawrence and I work for a charity called Creative Carbon Scotland, which is the national charity in Scotland connecting arts and sustainability. And we've been working uh, since 2011 to help reduce the environmental impact of the cultural sector and also explore its creative influencing potential in wider society. So um, I'm going to talk to you today for around about 15 minutes, and I wanted to sort of cover a range of topics. And this was following um, a brief conversation with Erin last week about the kind of different areas she thought might be interesting to explore. Um, so first of all, I thought I would go through um, some kind of broad def definitions of sustainable development and link that through to climate justice and why that's such an important aspect to be considering when we're thinking about action on climate change. And then uh, bring that back to why we're all here today to think about culture and our heritage and what role this has to play in addressing climate change. And finally, I thought it just helped to bring this to life with a few um, creative case studies, including uh, the National Mining Museum. Uh, so yeah, it's nice to, to uh, meet you, David. Um, and I'll finish up with a few takeaways. And I guess I just wanted to premise this by saying that Although um, Creative Carbon Scotland's work is you know, mostly focused on the cultural sector, um, I think there are many relevant crossovers with uh, heritage organisations and the work um, of different people working in heritage. And I think this would be a really interesting topic to sort of explore and discuss in the Q&A later on. So in terms of defining sustainable development, um, I think many of you will be aware what we mean by sustainable development, both in terms of theory and practice, is quite a highly debated uh, thing. But I've included here um, what is the sort of founding definition and one of the most used definitions uh, by the Brundtland Commission uh, way back in 1987, which described uh, sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this has been adopted by the United Nations, as well as many countries, and even down to sort of organization level. So this is the, this is the definition that uh, Creative Carbon Scotland has, for example, in our, um, in our mission. And for me, I think it asks us to think about the way in which we act now and how that supports the needs of future generations and our future planet. Another very sort of commonly cited um, definition or way of thinking about it is these sort of intersecting aspects of um, society, which include our economy, our environment, our society and our culture. And I think this kind of framework is quite interesting in terms of helping us to think about how we balance these different needs um, and potentially, you know, dealing with quite difficult decisions, but also helping us to think about how our behaviours and values all interact and therefore calling for a kind of new interdisciplinary or cross-sectoral approach to problem solving, which I think links to Creative Carbon Scotland's work in terms of helping to bridge these different um, areas of climate change and culture. So one example of this is, is pretty simple, but um, you know, an example could be that uh, if you take a conservation project, which is seeking to protect or restore an area of important e ecological significance, such as our ancient forests in the Cairngorms in Scotland. These forests obviously play a really crucial role in terms of supporting particular wildlife and their wider ecosystem, but they also represent a really important aspect of Scotland's cultural heritage, as well as contributing to people's health and well-being if they're accessing the forest for walks or for cycling, um, or just enjoying the beauty of the natural environment, uh, their sense of connection and place, 
um, and possibly also the local economy if there's different types of um, industries that are sort of interacting with taking place in the forest. So it's, it's really important that decisions that are taken, you know, from a kind of environmental background to conserve this area are also actively engaging with these other parts of society to make sure that it's managed sustainably in the future. In terms of climate justice, um, this is a kind of increasingly, I think it's an area that's growing in increasingly in people's knowledge, uh, particularly um, in Scotland, I think it is a sort of growing area around uh, COP26 and the discussions around that. And climate justice recognises that climate change is a social and political issue as much as a technical or environmental one. Um, so the, the definition which I just shared, for you, shared with you in relation to sustainable development, I think makes clear how today's children and young people and the children and young people of the future are living in a crisis which is not of their own making and, and will have significant impacts on the opportunities and their future ways of life. And this kind of highlights you know, one aspect of justice which is about intergenerational justice. But this quote, which I provided here by Tassine Jaffrey at the Glasgow Caledonian University, offers a kind of wider definition of justice, which recognises how climate change interacts with and exacerbates existing inequalities in our society. And it asks for an approach which is taking a kind of root cause, trying to tackle those root causes of the issues and helping to create a fair society. And at Creative Carbon Scotland, we've um, talked with... Uh, the organizations, the cultural organizations, arts organizations that we work with about climate justice, and they've highlighted a number of important issues which they think are, are important to address, um, kind of in their work, but also more widely in Scotland. So a couple of these points were around um, placing an emphasis on the disproportionate impacts of climate change, um, which are falling on um, already on disadvantaged people and therefore exacerbating inequalities that are already there. And they also raised a kind of importance of taking responsibility for the large contributions that Scotland and the UK have made and continue to make to global emissions and sharing those burdens and possibly even the opportunities of climate change fairly. So that's more about that kind of global climate justice picture. So you might ask, where does, where does culture fit into this? Where does heritage come in? Um, and at Creative Carbon Scotland, we think that our climate emergency is not just caused by or addressed by our politics, our science or our economic systems, it is a deeply cultural issue and it poses some very deep questions about our current ways of life and many aspects of our current ways of life are rooted in a sustainable, I'm sorry, a culture of unsustainable consumption. For example, the food we eat or the products we buy or the way that we heat our homes and the way that we travel. So our culture in our narrower sense, our, our arts, our heritage, our creative industries, as this quote says, help us to understand the past, make sense of the present and imagine the future. And we therefore think that there's a really crucial role for these different aspects of our culture to help shape and nurture a more, a more sustainable culture and society and way of life. Um, and I've included this photo here, a really cool example from the United States. It's a project called Recycled Artist in Residence, or RARE. And their mission is to challenge perceptions of waste culture by providing a platform for artists to work at the intersection of industry and sustainability. So this artist residency is based within a sort of recycling company site, a sort of construction and demolition, demolition uh, recycling company in Philadelphia. And they offer studio space for artists and also access to what they say is over 140 tons of materials per day uh, to work with creatively. And in addition to having artists based directly on their site, they also um, work on special projects with museums, with schools and communities across Philadelphia, providing artists and thinkers with opportunities to sort of physically grapple with the enormities of the challenges surrounding consumer society and also try and articulate better the questions that we need to ask ourselves um, when building this, this new way of living. So in terms of um, Creative Carbon Scotland's work and what we do to help the sector, the cultural sector, to realise their potential in addressing climate change, I just thought I'd talk through our sort of two key areas of work. The first is our transformation of culture programme. And this focuses uh, on in some ways working very practically with the cultural sector 
to help it to understand um, the impacts of climate change and also how they can contribute to both reducing carbon emissions and also taking on climate adaptation efforts, so adapting to the impacts of climate change that we're already feeling here in Scotland. One example of how we do this is through our Green Arts Initiative. Um, and there may be members within the volunteer organizer network who, who are part of this. It's a network of over 300 cultural organizations and groups that includes festivals, theaters, galleries, touring companies. Um, and I think it currently has a small number of museums and heritage trusts as well. And they're all engaged in attacking, tackling climate change, taking action in different ways. So within this initiative, um, each member is required to have a, a registered green champion, or they could have a number of green champions who help to, um, to sort of support this work within their organizations. And often that can start with engaging their staff, but it could also be linked to working with volunteers. Um, and in recent years, it's focused more on artistic programming and how to sort of engage their wider audiences in either adopting more sustainable behaviors, sharing knowledge and practices and skills, and also taking part in network events. Um, and support. And to complement this, uh, we uh, run our Culture Shift programme, which focuses on this widening, wider influencing potential of culture, which I mentioned earlier. And this is, this is more my direct area of work within, uh, within the charity. Um, so this work is supported by a number of key programmes. Uh, on the left-hand side is a photo from our Green uh, Teas programme, which is an ongoing event series that we run in collaboration with artists and sustainability practitioners who are interested in building links across their different disciplines, their different sectors. And often these events involve direct collaborations between people working across different fields to kind of explore a particular issue or um, you know, work in uh, a particular context. So they're, they're kind of ongoing and is, is really just trying to create that sort of framework for people to get together and share work and hopefully build collaborations over the long term. And then the other, another key part of the programme is uh, a range of shorter term and longer term projects, which aim to test, explore and demonstrate the potential of creative practices to contribute to climate change initiatives, both here in Scotland and also we've done some work internationally as well. So now I thought I'd just share with you um, three examples to really help bring this to life <laughs> and, and show you, I guess, how some different ways in which artists and arts organizations are exploring uh, and addressing climate change in their work. So the first uh, project I wanted to mention is um, Climate Beacons for COP26. And I think many of you will be aware that Glasgow is uh, this November hosting the world's largest political and civic climate change gathering, um, which is tipped to be a game changer in terms of commitments to emissions reduction and also climate adaptation targets that countries make. So in response to this, um, we're supporting a project called Climate Beacons. This is a network of more than 30 environmental, cultural and heritage organizations who are collaborating across uh, seven key locations in Scotland to inspire public engagement and positive action on climate change. And this is a photo from uh, a workshop being run by the Midlothian Climate Beacon a collaboration between the National Mining Museum and the British Geological Survey. And they've launched a brand new um, series of STEM climate change workshops for primary schools, which uh, really creatively combine art with science for a sort of free, interactive and engaging series of events with young people. And they're also planning to organize exhibitions and conferences exploring um, Scotland's past legacy of fossil fuels and the journey towards a future um, of decarbonization. I think this is really interesting in terms of working with communities who've typically been um, more excluded from the climate change debate. Another um, fantastic example is the work of Glasgow Women's Library. Um, they've been addressing sustainability in a range of different ways um, and also exploring how they can work together with their volunteers and their local community to make positive changes to their local environment. So aspects of this work has included they have a uh, I love the name of this, a creative green cluster made up of staff and volunteers um, who lead on things such as programming events, which highlight women's contributions to uh, climate activism. They do very practical work, uh, reducing uh, their carbon footprints as, as an organization. And they also um, are a very active member of our Green Arts Initiative and do a lot to share their experience and learnings with other organizations. 
So practical changes that they've made recently, uh, they've installed some secondary glazing and also LED lighting throughout their building with a grant from the Climate Challenge Fund. And because of the monitoring of their emissions that they've been doing for some time now, they knew that this would help to make significant reductions to their own carbon footprint. And then pictured here up on the right, in 2019, they partnered with a local primary school and the Royal Horticultural Society to plan, plant and look after a garden outside their building. And then they extended this work in 2020, in 2020 last year, when they installed planters in their local uh, train station in Bridgeton. So I think these projects provide some really nice examples of different creative ways in which a cultural and heritage organization is collaborating with its neighbors to find a new way of caring for its local environment. And uh, the final example I want to share, this is a particular favorite of mine, is the Museum of Future Now. This is by uh, artists Joe Hodges and Robbie Coleman and uh, climate professor Mike Bonaventura. And they describe this project as an evolving series of speculative artworks and participatory workshops designed to explore the web of ecological, cultural and technological factors that combine to create complex challenges for society and the environment, both now and in the future. So as you can see in this picture, participants are invited to put on some white uh, sort of gloves in the style that you might do if you're working with a, a precious archive. They're given an object and they're given three cards and within 30 minutes, they're asked to work with their fellow participants to develop a sort of speculative scenario of narratives um, about the provenance of this object. And after writing it together, they're then invited to share it back with a wider group who've been doing the same, but with the different object, different set of factors. And they've run this in a range of settings, including academic, environmental management conferences and community workshops. They've also redesigned it to take place online during the pandemic. And to me, it's just a really nice example of an artistic response to the uncertainties and the challenges posed by climate change and offers a different way in for us to think about how the decisions and actions we take now will have an impact further down the line. Just included this as a very quick slide. If, if you're interested, then I, I would encourage you to have a look on our website. We have many other examples of both practical and artistic uh, case studies on our website. We also have um, much more in-depth case studies about uh, the types of projects I mentioned in our Culture Shift program through our Library of Creative Sustainability. So um, do go, go on and have a look if you're interested. And yeah, just wanted to, to wrap up with a few takeaways. So hopefully this has provided um, some useful kind of wider background theory and policy around sustainability and climate, climate justice in particular. Um, hopefully I've helped to sort of build the case as to why I think culture and our heritage have such an important role to play and some interesting examples that you might want to share or draw on for your own work and ideas. Um, so in terms of things to, to take away, I think it's, it's interesting to think about which areas you might be particularly interested in exploring? Is it the more practical emissions reduction? Is it uh, engaging with artistic programming? Or is it more about engaging uh, with communities or different audiences? Consider how your organization is currently or could be addressing issues relating to climate justice. So that might be the, the sort of specific topics or themes that you're addressing, or it might be the way in which you're seeking to engage different people in the process. And finally, just using platforms such as these, which are so fantastic to help build connections with like-minded people and organizations and using that as a platform for wider action. Um, so that's me. Um, like I say, thank you for listening. And yeah, very keen to sort of take any questions or thoughts that this has prompted. I've also included my email address, which we'll share after. So feel free to get in touch if you have any wider or other questions uh, following this. Great. So Gemma isn't actually here with us today, so we can't directly say thanks, Gemma. But if you're watching this recording at any point, Gemma, thank you very much. So we aren't going to have a live Q&A, but if you do have any questions, reflections, thoughts on her presentation, then please do save them up and we can add them into the panel session um, for the panel members later on in the event. So on to our first live speaker for the day, and that is Lindsay Marston. And Lindsay is going to talk about empowering volunteers to become advocates for conservation through sustainable volunteering. 
Lindsay has been with the conservation charity Chester Zoo as their volunteer manager for two years. She was a member of the North West Heritage Volunteering Group and British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums, of which she is a committee member of the Volunteer Managers Working Group. Lindsay is a keen micro volunteer who has been an NHS responder during the pandemic and also participates in community support um, through digital volunteering. So I'd like to welcome up Lindsay, please. Thanks everyone. So um, uh, as Rosie said, my name is Lindsay Marston and I'm the volunteer manager at Chester Zoo. We're the most visited zoo in the UK and we're also a conservation education charity and we're working to prevent extinction. So I'm going to be talking about our sustainability work, our journey so far and our plans to empower volunteers to become advocates for conservation through sustainable volunteering. Volunteers are part of our conservation education and engagement team. We engage with 250 volunteers every year through various roles and volunteering opportunities. This includes youth volunteering, visitor engagement and education volunteering. The role of volunteers is to advocate for wildlife and conservation with zoo visitors, connecting them with nature and empowering them to make positive life changes to benefit wildlife. In 2021, we shared our plan for volunteering, created with volunteers and various stakeholders. Our plan is the focus of our work over the next few years. It's our commitment to providing an outstanding volunteer experience and our vision to create a thriving and inclusive volunteer community. It highlights how we will work towards one of the key targets in the Chester Zoo Conservation Master Plan which aims to empower 10 million people to live more sustainably before our 100th birthday in 2031. Volunteers are a huge part of that target audience as educators themselves and as people that we hope to empower to take sustainable action. We have six key priorities to help us to achieve our vision. The purpose of priority six is to empower volunteers to become advocates for conservation through sustainable actions in their daily lives. So some of our plans to achieve this include training volunteers to increase their awareness for wildlife and conservation issues and the ways that they can make a personal difference. Creating calls to action, focusing, focusing on sustainable living choices and conservation action for volunteers during every single training session and in our regular volunteer comms, hoping to help them to recognise the personal impact they can make not just the impact that they can have on visitors. We want to give volunteers the knowledge and skills to create mini campaigns or events with their own communities, such as sustainable gift giving ideas, recycle fashion shows or community litter picking. Community volunteering is a fantastic sustainable volunteering method. It reduces the need for volunteers to travel outside of their local area. In some instances, volunteers can literally volunteer on their own patch in local parks, community centres and green spaces. We've recently been awarded funding to create a 10 mile nature recovery corridor connecting wildlife habitats in Chester. Community involvement is integral to the project and we want to be inclusive and reach out to disadvantaged audiences. Through this project, we aim to deliver wildlife champion training courses, training 90 people from the local community to learn new skills and improve their green spaces to benefit wildlife. The project will also include lots of conservation action days. These will be opportunities for anyone in their community to get hands on for a day with activities. And these activities will be planned by partners, champions, volunteers, schools and community groups. We hope to engage around 4000 people across 200 action days in their local communities. Micro volunteering is a big part of how we will achieve our sustainable volunteering aims. It's a powerful volunteer engagement tool. It gives volunteers a way to use their skills and passion for wildlife to benefit our conservation aims. And it can be done anywhere at any time. It's really flexible and we feel it can overcome barriers to, to traditional volunteering. It helps us to mitigate our travel emissions and provides multiple opportunities for people to make a positive difference for conservation. It's not just digital volunteering. Some of the opportunities that we've created include wildlife monitoring through our Hedgehog Watch project and creating habitats for wildlife. Our community hub on our website provides people with a way to share their conservation action 
or micro volunteering stories. We also use digital certificates and e-badges on better impact to show volunteers how they can make a personal difference to our conservation goals and it helps them to know just how much we appreciate them too. Digital recognition methods are a, a great way of recognising volunteers for their, um, their contribution and it's a great way of um, reducing the need to um, use items such as balloons um, or other items that may end up in waste streams. As part of our strategic plans, we will, we will continue to develop micro-volunteering to help us to provide various ways that people can contribute to our mission to prevent extinction and encourage participation and engagement from audiences that we just don't see face to face. We know that many people want to be involved in our work. Micro-volunteering enables people to make a positive difference for wildlife in a sustainable way. This year, we've also been engaging and educating volunteers and visitors through our Love It For Longer campaign, which focuses on our plan to become a zero waste zoo and carbon net zero by 2030. So we've been, been inspiring them to adapt more sustainable behaviours in their everyday lives. So this includes things like looking at their single, single use plastic use, uh, thinking about their food waste, their water consumption, and even the way that they buy clothes. And volunteers have been really inspired by this project and this campaign and throughout our plan for volunteering we hope to really build on that and offer volunteers the opportunity for peer learning and ways that they can showcase their sustainable living methods too. We also have a long-running high-profile sustainable palm oil campaign to protect rainforest habitats for threatened wildlife such as orangutans. Throughout the campaign, we have educated volunteers to understand more about the palm oil issue, giving them the knowledge and skills to educate visitors and encourage sustainable shopping habits in their own lives. We've created simple and regular calls to action, such as helping volunteers to access our sustainable palm oil shopping list, challenging them to create recipes and bake using sustainable palm oil ingredients as well. Through our baseline and annual reviews, volunteers have shown self-reported improvements in their knowledge of conservation issues, their ability to make a difference and how environmentally friendly that they behave. We also want to ensure that our volunteer programme <clears throat> is run as sustainably as possible to ensure that we follow the, that we follow the message and ethos of Chester Zoo. So here are also a few examples of other things that we do. So we, we reduce paper wherever we can. So we use a digital volunteer management system rather than paper spreadsheets and application forms. Although we do have an option for paper applications or um, training materials for people that face digital exclusion. We promote recycling and donation of goods. We have a volunteer led scam, uh, scam, stamp recycling scheme and really good free to a good home schemes as well. We look for items that are made using recycled materials when we choose our education resources and we also check the sustainable palm oil status of relevant project pro products that we use. We also give volunteers reusable Chester Zoo water pouches as part of their uniform and this prevents them from using single use plastic bottles when they're on site as well. We provide sustainable options for training. So we use virtual meetings, video content, digital resources. It reduces the need for volunteers to make non-essential journeys and it aims to make training more accessible to volunteers who might not be able to attend in-person meetings for various reasons. We encourage volunteers to consider the most sustainable travel methods to come to the zoo. And this is walking, cycling, using public transport, trains, buses, whatever they can get to us and um, we encourage them to use it. We also encourage car sharing where appropriate, although that's something that we've not encouraged so much during COVID. Um, and as an organisation, we pay for staff and volunteers to travel by bus to the zoo for free. So we pay into a scheme. Um, and in the past, before COVID, we did run a green travel reward scheme for people that were using sustainable travel methods as well. So thank you for listening. Uh, we are really excited about our plan for volunteering and our sustainable journey that we've created with volunteers. We're really looking forward to building upon our research in this area as well with volunteers so that we can, um, we can gain a greater understanding of our impact over time. So watch this space. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, for anyone that wasn't um, here with us at a previous Knowledge Share event, um, Lindsay also spoke to us about returning volunteers safely um, earlier in the year in May. And it's really great to hear from you again, Lindsay. So um, conscious that we've got uh, two minutes until the break time and there's one question and it came through from me. So I think I'll just quickly ask it um, since I am live here. Um, Lindsay, I was interested to know, did you have to lead any policy changes within the zoo um, to increase digital volunteer engagement? Um, yeah, we actually, we, we redid our, um, our volunteer policy itself um, to talk about the different ways that we're going to engage volunteers. You know, I talked about the training before, you know, and in, you know, encouraging people to not make non-essential journeys to the zoo as well. So within our um, volunteer policy itself, it does talk about encouraging sustainable travel and encouraging us to use different methods of, of training for volunteers too. Um, we also, um, our expenses volunteer policy for volunteers is actually our sustainable travel and expenses policy for volunteers now. So that's something that we've we uh, did this year um, and that again it really focuses on encouraging volunteers to think about sustainable travel methods before they think of other travel methods um, what we don't want to do is create barriers to people that can't use those me other methods of travel um, but on the whole we want people to consider you know could I use the bus you know Chester Zoo provides this for me for free and that's something that we thought was really important to put into our our policies as well and in our daily practice with volunteers. Oh, thank you. And are those policies available online from your website if others want to have a look? Oh, no, I don't know. They're on our better impact for volunteers, but, you know, happy to share with anyone that wants yeah. to. OK, that'd be really interesting. I think if you're happy for anyone to direct message you, maybe with a with an email address, if they're interested to see that policy. I know I certainly I'd be quite keen to, to have a look. Um, OK, great. I see we've got another um question that has come through um, from Sarah Pierce. Sarah, if we could save that for the panel discussion at the end, um, that would be great because we've got an opportunity to get back on track um, timing wise. So I'm just going to quickly pass over to um, Vanessa. Um, and Vanessa is going to quickly introduce Multimeter um, as a wee optional tool that we've got for the rest of the event. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Rosie. Um, brilliant, Lindsay. Um, just tweeted about that as well because it's really great. So thank you. Um, I've just put into the chat a link to Mentimeter so that you can actually connect to that later. And um, you can also do it at any point now if you want to start putting your questions in there as well. Um, obviously, feel free to put some questions in the chat, but wherever possible, we are going to try and put them on there so we can put them to the panel. Um, it's a collaborative tool. Um, and the difference from it from chat is, as you can probably appreciate, as all that information is going up in chat, it's trying to capture them all. And Susan's desperately trying to do a great job there. I know she is um, in capturing them all as well. But Mentimeter does allow us as a collaborative tool to add your own. And sometimes when you see a question and then you think, oh, that's just what I was going to ask. So go click on the like on Mentimeter and you can actually then say that that's something that you're interested. It lets us see what's popular. And if necessary, if we've got so many questions that we're not going to be able to get through, then we can obviously prioritise. So like I said, if you go in, use that link, open it up, um, then you can actually then click on the Q&A and you can submit your questions and you can see all the questions that are already in there and you can like any of the ones that you want to use so feel free to use that anytime in preparation for the panel thanks very much great thank you very much Vanessa so we're going to have a first tea break now so you've got some time to play around with Mentimeter during the tea break and um, if you wish to do so so we're going to break now and um, please be back by 10 55 sharp for our next speaker which will be Robert McPhail from Tarbot Castle Trust and he's going to be talking about community ownership and sustainable volunteering so we will see you all back here at 5 to 11 thank you Hello everybody and welcome back after our first tea break. So we're going to get started with our next speaker and our next speaker is Robert McPhail, who is a trustee with the Tarbert Castle Trust and is going to be talking about community ownership and sustainable volunteering. Robert is a former architect, having retired from his practice in Glasgow in 2000. After moving to Tarbert, he became focused on working to preserve Tarbert Castle, becoming a member of its board of trustees, as well as taking on the role of secretary and treasurer. 
In 2017, he was awarded an MBE for his extraordinary services to the community. So I'd like to pass over to uh, Robert and Rosie B is going to share her screen for Robert's presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I've been tasked this morning with telling you basically about our project here in Tarbert, which has been running for uh, 17 years. Uh, we uh, took over ownership of a ruined castle uh, in uh, about 2003, and we've been working away and still continue to, to work on that. Next slide, please. This is where we are. Uh, in Tarbert, uh, that's relevant, uh, the very narrow isthmus which separates the Mull of Kintyre from the rest of the mainland. Uh, the word Tarbert itself it means isthmus and uh, there are a number of Tarberts in Scotland. This one's called Tarbert Loch Fine. It's a beautiful village with a harbour and the location of the castle uh, is, is there simply because, of course, it's a very strategic position. Uh, it allows you, in the days when uh, water was the motorway, uh, you could come from the River Clyde across to Tarbert, take your boats over the narrow isthmus and be out in the islands uh, in no time. Both the Vikings and Robert the Bruce did that. Next slide, please. The castle is above the south side of the village. It dates from the 8th century as a castle. Before that, it was almost certainly a dun. Uh, it's, it's on a piece of very high ground, as you can see, with great views. Uh, King Robert the Bruce uh, strengthened and rebuilt most of the castle in 1325, uh, extending it to a very large area. The tower house is the only bit still upstanding. The rest is, is, is outlines of ruined walls and towers. Uh, uh, the tower house was built by James IV in 1494. Next slide, please. And animation on that one, there we are. Uh, the, that's the map of the ground that we own, basically. The area uh, of the castle is um, uh, scheduled and therefore, it is protected under scheduling by Historic Environment Scotland, but we also own ground behind, which we have developed into our interests. Uh, we have a wildlife pond, a walk around here for the community and visitors, and uh, an orchard. Uh, biodiversity has been increased considerably on the site uh, by uh, the, the creation of the woodland and the orchard. Next slide, please. This is the site as best one could photograph it before we started. It was a mess. Uh, it was virtually inaccessible. There was a very large fence around the tower because it was ready to collapse. It's covered in alien type vegetation. This vegetation was destroying the ruins uh, and uh, it, it had no more than a couple of very persistent visitors a year who could make their way up through the jungle uh, and uh, uh, visit the, uh, the ruins, which were almost invisible at that time. You can see the state the tower house was in. There was rubbish everywhere. Uh, and we decided that the only way we were going to get anywhere was to get on with the job, really, and, and clear the site after we took ownership of it. Next slide, please. I'll just go through these quickly now to just show you activity. That's the whole primary school, which is only 200 metres away. So the castle has become a great resource for the, for the whole school's primary and secondary school. We've had drama, we've had art, uh, 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 we've got a forest school for the primary school, and we get regular work parties involving uh, students up to, to help us. But that was the whole primary school out, hauling logs off the site, which were being cut down to try and uh, get the, the roots clear of the ruins. Next slide, please. More work being done. You can see us chipping here in the middle, uh, the, the uh, jungle being cleared, accessibility being improved. That uh, work party day with the work party, uh, everybody drinking tea during the tea break was the biggest work party day we've ever had. 36 people attended that uh, at once, and uh, we did a great deal of work. 
down in the bottom uh, left corner there, you'll see that brown material uh, being applied. We realized that as we stripped uh, the uh, vegetation, there was a danger of erosion. And working with the HES, uh, we, have a, we applied this brown biodegradable mat all over the ruins and uh, sowed seed on them. Uh, so that we could easily maintain the site and keep down the type of vegetation that was destroying the archaeology on the site. Our sheep arrived. Uh, we use Hebridean sheep to keep the grass cut. I don't know how we would manage without them. And they've also been a great attraction for visitors and uh, local people. Next slide, please. Uh, the tower house was a major project. Uh, it cost uh, three quarters of a million pound to have it repaired. This money came from the Rural Development Fund and uh, Michael Russell, our MSP, was a fantastic supporter of the work that we did. Uh, that's the senior pupils from the school, the, the head teacher, etc., and some volunteers. Uh, on the right-hand side are volunteers uh, building a, a viewing platform within the tower so that you could, that the public could access it when it was completed. Next slide, please. That's the tower cleared now and open and the staircase access down here, uh, built uh, the platform you can see in front of the tower, you see the way it was in the, the picture in the corner there. Uh, this allowed uh, the visitors to, to get close to it and see it, and we've got an interpretation panel on it. We of course realized as uh, part of our environmental assessment for the stripping of the uh, vegetation, was that we were in effect uh, destroying biodiversity to save the monument in effect. And we were already turning our minds to how we were going to resolve that. And I'll move on to that now. Next slide. Uh, just to celebrate completion of all of that initial work, uh, we held a medieval melee, which uh, was a local event uh, with fun and games. The most popular thing of all was naming the two little lambs. Our sheep had now had lambs in the corner here and in the left hand uh, corner uh, the uh, uh, spinning group which was formed to spin our, our sheep's wool. Uh, we obtained funds for them to buy spinning wheels and that spinning group is still going today. Uh, on the other side is the group were made volunteers of the year in 2008. Next slide please. We're now fully integrated with the community, the stars at Christmas, the fireworks are, are part of the Scottish series, a large yachting event which is held in the village and the fireworks are set off from the castle and the castle is floodlit on the last picture on the right hand side, you can see the, the, the tower floodlit above the uh, harbour itself. The festivals uh, often involve themselves with the harbour. We've, we've given sheep shearing demonstrations at our local festivals and some events take place at the castle. Next slide, please. We started to offset the, the lack of biodiversity on the monoculture created on the scheduled area by working on a woodland. Uh, we've now planted well over a thousand trees. We'll be planting another hundred this year. Uh, school children take part, volunteers take part. And we dug out a large lochan in the bottom of the valley uh, to retain water there and to help dry the site, which was, was really boggy. The trees, of course, were selected species which grow in these circumstances and they've done a big job in, in clearing up. This work with the school led to us running the Rural Skills uh, uh, practical course at the academy, at the, the Castle Fort Tarbert Academy. And we've had several people over, over the years doing this. Next slide, please. That's an overall view. There's our lochan that we created here, and these are all our planted, new, newly planted trees all around here. We now have a sculpture park within that area and paths created. You can see the views you get from the castle. They're really quite magnificent. Next slide, please. That's our orchard. I, this was just another piece of spare ground the way we inherited with the castle. And uh, it was a, another messy 
bogies out of sight. We dug ditches, created raised beds, which you see the trees planted on. And we're now producing fruit annually, uh, 20 odd kilos of soft fruit this year. Apples are beginning to come in larger numbers. And uh, again, we're, we're supplementing the planting and doing work there every year. Uh, an interesting thing we did, we had children from the school plant a herring below every tree, which is a worldwide traditional practice uh, in, in, in uh, fruit planting. Next slide, please. We moved on now to our educational programme, and this is the first archaeological dig that we, we, we carried out. We had had a major survey done uh, a, of the whole site, a desktop survey with a, 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 our archaeologist, Roddy Regan. Uh, this is an essential factor feature if you're going to do a, a study, a, a an actual dig, and that was done some years ago now, I think mean, way back in 2011. Uh, but Roddy had noticed an area out with the scheduled site just in the, the entry, near the entrance to the castle. We got permission from the landowner to carry out a dig there uh, because it was thought that probably the original village would be up on this higher level round about the castle, and indeed it was. We, we found a medieval pottery, a small house with a buyer, and it, this also acted as a test for our ability to run a bigger dig, which was coming up in the next uh, year. Next slide, please. 2019, we carried out a major archaeological dig over a period of two months. 52 volunteers took place from all over. 250 school children took place. A very considerable organised uh, project. Uh, our team of five volunteers did all the organisation and fundraising. It cost us about 30 odd thousand pounds. Uh, we worked with Kilmartin Museum and obviously our archaeologists supervised the, the whole affair. Lots of fines, uh, several thousand in fact. Uh, but uh, the most important thing uh, was that we discovered a Western entrance to the site, which had never been previously historically recorded. Uh, we found uh, a portcullis slot and door checks and dress red sandstone. This was all part of Robert Bruce's extension and reconstruction. Next slide, please. This is uh, another dig that we've carried out subsequently. Uh, over at the West Loch and an unscheduled area within, we actually have in the records office in Edinburgh, the accounts that Robert Le Bruce received for the castle. And one of them was for funds set aside uh, for a peel at the West Loch. This uh, would allow a peel being a signal station basically. And that's the base of it that we unearthed there. This would, anyone standing there in a small hut, presumably record, record, located on top of that, would be able to see right down the West Loch uh, and see approaching uh, soldiers or anything else for that matter. Uh, and it would have a direct line of sight to the castle, which is about half a meter, uh, half a mile away from that uh, to signal uh, a message to the, the castle itself. Next slide, please. The, uh, some years ago now, we created this entrance. We've always struggled with money. It's always been a difficult uh, task uh, with no, no means of funding, really. Uh, we we uh, built this entrance here uh, and uh, we used to just go in a gate. But by creating this little entrance, we always had a donation box at our interpretation panels. By creating this sense of entry to the site, uh, with a poster and a donations box, we've doubled our, our, our donations that we received from the visiting public. We're now getting four, more than 40,000 visitors annually. Uh, we recorded the numbers on the site for two years round about the dig, and in fact, we had 46,000 visitors in those years. Uh, that After the dig, we've created a new interpretation area, and you can see that on the, the right-hand side there. Uh, the original uh, deputation area consisted of only two panels. Now it's got four panels and it's got a canopy, but all built by volunteers. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about the uh, climate effect. Uh, these 
steep pass it's on top of a hill and most visitors comment on the, the agony of the journey up there because it's a long way up uh the steep pass of course uh, when you get torrential rain which we've had in the last couple of years very severely uh, you get erosion and this part, whole part here had been eroded away down about half a meter uh, down to the rock, in fact, and it's very difficult to do drainage on a schedule monument because you can't dig up the ground easily. And so we created here, apart from diversion, diverting some of the water off the path further up, we've created steps here, stone steps, which help to, to retain the path. And that's what we've just done this, this winter. Next slide, please. This is another winter project, that is our Lochan. Uh, the, the paths at the moment are on the other side of the, uh, were on the other side of the Lochan. This winter we created this new path in among our now semi-mature mature trees that surround it. That's one of our, our uh, sculptures on the site, which are based on, on geometric forms. That one, needless to say, is a hexagon. Next. Uh, Slide, please. Now, this is a slide just demonstrating how we are organized. Uh, we should have an animation there. Uh, trustees uh, are protect the ownership of the castle. Uh, these are all local people. Uh, I am secretary and treasurer. And our volunteer groups are divided up, as you see, uh, not formally, but they're there nevertheless. These people work independently on their own work. Someone feeds the sheep every day in the window. The, me the website's kept up to date by someone else. We've got waste management uh, with 40,000 visitors. A lot of rubbish comes off the site in a year. We cater for our, our uh, volunteers. We have uh, education things like uh, I mentioned with the school. Uh, and we uh, maintain the site all the time. The only time we meet as a full group is once a month on a Saturday morning to do the maintenance. We run separate projects uh, which are outlined uh, at the end there. Uh, this year we're working on a new uh, project to make a video of the village and the castle and this will be run on revolving displays in the village because we lost our Visit Scotland office uh, a couple of years ago now. Next slide please. And there we are. Uh, this is this diagram has been in use for some time, and it helps to it helps to summarise what community ownership and volunteering at the castle has done for the village and and the area. Uh, I've tried to summarise uh, up in this list at the side uh, how we've dealt with sustainability. Uh, with biodiversity, with environmental impact and community health and well-being, as well as heritage, which is our main function at the top there. Uh, we've certainly increased uh, biodiversity on the site with our woodland or lochan or auction beehives. And we actually have an adder reserve, not popular with everyone, but full of adders. Uh, we've uh, Got our environmental impact is looked at with every project to make sure we're, we're, we're keeping ourselves as low carbon as possible. Uh, there is a team who've been on a scything course and where we have to cut and cut stuff back. This is done mainly using uh, scythes. Uh, our, our volunteers are, are a happy lot and uh, they they uh, they enjoy the the, the meetings and the. Uh, uh, that we have at the site. We have no formal meetings. We simply do this during during uh, tea breaks. Next slide, please. That's me finished. Uh, I, I thank you for listening. And uh, I'm no doubt I might get some questions. I can answer these as they come along. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. That was really interesting to hear. So I'd like to pass over to Susan, um, who's going to got some questions for Robert. 
Robert, like everybody else, I was really, really fascinated by your project. And I think that's come through in, in the questions in the chat in particular. Um, Lauren Roden has posed a question I was thinking about myself, which was when you sort of started this project, did you have an overall vision in mind? And did you have sort of set a sort of step program of funding or did it develop in a more organic way? Because it seems like there are so many disparate elements that have developed I don't know if anybody could have come up with that plan at the very beginning, or maybe you're just a like a genius who just no, comes not, up with I'm these ideas. Not a genius, and it, it's it is organic. Yes, that is exactly what it is. But that was a policy, and you have to go a wee bit further back. Um, a previous group uh, formed a company back in the nineties to try and do something with the castle, but they didn't get anywhere. And my view was. That it was simply because they bit off too much. They tried to do a massive feasibility study to see how it, you could improve it and open it up and get everything. And it would have cost so much. They couldn't raise the money. Finance wasn't so handy in those days anyway. So when we took over ownership uh, in about 2003, four, uh, I had the job of writing a strategy. And that was all. And that strategy was get on with it ourselves clear the site and see where it goes. That didn't go down well with HGS, I have to say. They wanted to see the big picture, but hard luck, no way you could do a big picture because we're not geniuses. <laughs> we simply started and felt our way through it and everything's been like that. It's all decided by volunteers. There's no policy committee over them or anything like that. They decide what they want to do next. And uh, it's actually quite difficult to keep them busy. They've got so many ideas. That's how we got where we are. That's absolutely fascinating. And what has your turnover been like in terms of your volunteers? Are people sticking with you from the start? Yes, we have volunteers that have been with us since the beginning. Uh, it's been going for 17 years. So we, we've lost some uh, uh, due to them dying. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's been a long time. Uh, we've, we've probably had about 80 actual on the site volunteers uh, over the years. Uh, currently, I work with a pool of about 30. And at the beginning of uh, last month on the Saturday morning, and indeed that will be out again tomorrow morning, although it's looking a bit wet, uh, we had 14. And we normally get between about 10 and 15, 20, maybe if we're lucky, on that regular basis. But of course, there are all these other little groups of doing things like media and what have you, and they're all part of that 30. We, uh, we have a local membership. Uh, everybody on, in the village is allowed to, in the postcode 29, is, is allowed, PA29, is allowed uh, to be a member, and uh, we, our newsletter goes to about 200 people, something like that. That's fascinating. And um, just finally, I get the sense that you are very much the leader and you're really, you're the one who sort of catalyzes all the efforts. Have you managed to sort of delegate a little bit more or do you feel that it all still relies very much on you being the lead? No, the, the delegation comes through that second or third last slide that I showed of the different types of volunteers. They've chosen those activities. Some people don't want to do this. Some people, for instance, the, the media, I think one or two of those that do the media, one of them I don't think hardly ever been on the site, but that, <laughs> they do that themselves. The people who look after the sheep, there's a rotor. I certainly issue the rotor, but after that, they just get on with it. It happens. Uh, and the same with a lot of the other stuff. So in that sense, there is delegation. Mm -hmm. And uh, much of the physical work now, we have some good younger volunteers now in place. And uh, I'm a bit old for some of the very heavy physical work that we do, and that certainly gets delegated. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Robert. I think it's a really great example of sustainable volunteering. Back over to you, Rosie. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Susan and Robert. And Robert, really looking forward to having you um, back on the panel later on in the event. So we're now going to hear from Sylvia Meyer, Myers, ecologist and volunteer manager with the Natural History Museum. Sylvia is going to talk about embedding climate change awareness and sustainability into volunteering. Sylvia has been managing conservation volunteers in London for eight years. Their career has focused on gardening for wildlife and empowering community groups to make changes in local spaces. 
They currently work in the wildlife garden at the Natural History Museum, leading volunteers in practical tasks, recording wildlife and training volunteers in species identification, recording techniques and ecology. They love showing people the wonders, uh, the wonder of the overlooked, whether it is pavement plants, tiny soil creatures or urban pigeons. Over to you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so as been wonderful introduction from Rosie there uh, on Sylvia. Um, so this first slide just shows the wildlife garden at the Natural History Museum. A lot of people don't really realise it even exists. Um, it's about 1.5 acres. It's got a range of different habitats. We've got meadows, we've got woodland, we've got ponds, we've got wetland, we've got a tiny bit of heath. Um, and we've got a team of about 25 or so volunteers um, helping to maintain those habitats and try and keep them distinct in what's really quite a small area. Uh, so originally when I was sort of thinking about this presentation, we were kind of, we had a title of learning about climate change through volunteering and that didn't seem quite right because we don't run sessions that are just completely climate focused, but so throughout everything that we do in the wildlife garden, climate change comes up very naturally. Um, so I sort of divide this roughly into three sections. We've got the teaching and training that we do about wildlife, which tends to end up incorporating climate change. We've got the sustainable practices, so as we're doing the practical work about the garden, how are we doing those sustainably? And then just the everyday things that, just the little things that um, make life as a volunteer at the museum sustainable. So first you're thinking about the species side. So um, I run sessions teaching the volunteers how to identify wildlife, how to recall wildlife, and climate change just always seems to pop up in those because nature has noticed climate change happening. Um, and so it shows up in the records in the wildlife garden and throughout London. This picture is the Willow Emerald, so in the 20th century, if you saw a willow emerald, um, you would be exceptionally excited and you'd tell all your friends and it would be amazing. Um, but now, over the last 10 or 15 years, they're everywhere. They breed throughout the south of England and they're doing really well. And they've come over here because it's now warm enough for them to breed. Um, and there's a similar story with Jersey tiger moths, which, um, yeah, over the, again, same, same same time scale, 10, 15 years, they've popped up and they're here and our volunteers keep talking about them. There's one of our volunteers who uh, almost sets his sort of annual seasonal clock by the arrival of a Jersey tiger moth. Um, and then we've got the intrinsic value of wildlife that also comes across through these sessions. So this is a slug. Um, and we try and encourage people to respect all of the wildlife. So all the wildlife has value. There isn't the gross wildlife that we don't really like or the pests, it's all lovely things. So um, try and introduce species that people might not know about. So things like harvestmen or pseudoscorpions, small soil creatures that most people don't even realize exist um, to show them that biodiversity. Um, and then sometimes the creatures that people don't quite like, things like spiders. So we have a lot of spiders that live in the toilet at work and we try and encourage the volunteers to think of those as just part of the habitat. You know, the loo is their home, somewhere we use as well. It's a shared space. Uh, and with the slugs then, I've had one of the volunteers tell me, oh, I do think of the, uh, the slugs in the wildlife garden as being very precious and always make sure that I move them off the path. So I think the knowledge of the, the idea that everything has value is going through. Um, so bringing in fungi, because that's obviously a particularly important part in, um, in nutrient cycling and in carbon sequestration. Uh, so we do an annual fungi walk and talk. And this year I was particularly focusing on the sort of hidden world of fungi. So, the mycorrhizal relationships they might have with, uh, with trees. So this is a fly agaric and a, and a silver birch. Um, and also things like deep sea ocean fungi, which 
obviously we don't have in the world life garden depth of a deep ocean um but it's something that's there's very little known about the deep sea fungi but it's almost certainly doing a very important job in sequestering carbon in, carbon in the oceans and I wanted to make sure that was part of the story that I was telling the telling the volunteers so now looking into the sort of practices that we're doing in the wildlife garden so I thought I had to start with the compost bins because they are just such a key focus focal point of so much of what we're doing in the garden um, there's not many tasks that don't involve waste ending up in the compost bins or turning the compost or digging around in it for toads um, or admiring these wonderful fox earths that have been created um, in one of those pictures. Um, this is a key place where um, we use, we're really using the resources that we've got on site. So this is where a lot of our green waste is going. Um, and then we end up with the conversations about compost and about peat. Um, and We've got a lot of volunteers who prize our compost and love that not only is it really valuable for growing things, but it also comes with lots of interesting seeds, lots of wildflowers that they can grow in their garden if they take a bit of our compost home. Um, so thinking of sort of what's waste and what isn't waste, then one of the main sort of waste streams of the wildlife garden is leaves because we have a lot of huge plane trees. And we do need to do some removal of these because on the path network, um, it can become unsafe and unaccessible. So we have to clear up the leaves. And quite a lot of these do go into sort of green waste skips. So we've been looking recently into how to reduce that and make sure that those leaves are having the maximum value for, for wildlife actually on the site. Um, so this is what's being created here by the volunteers is a little leaf pen to keep some of the leaves in so that we've got that leaf filled habitat we've got the nutrients staying on site um, and all the wood that's used to make this leaf pen is just bits that we've cut from the site as well um, and again thinking about um, using what we've got so wood is such an important resource on the site and we do have to cut trees back sometimes um, but then every bit of wood has life beyond that. And we will make log piles. We will set the logs into the soil like this to make stag beetle loggeries. Um, and it's, we sort of see it as this really important, valuable thing, but not as a resource for humans, but for wildlife, for all these little silly scorpions and slugs and harvestmen. Um, then, Sort of the edges and hedges I've sort of titled this bit. Uh, so sometimes we need to create barriers around the site just to stop the public running straight into some of the more delicate bits of habitat. Um, and we could buy in lots of treated wood, lots of steel to make fences. But instead, our first port of call is to look, well, what have we already got on the site? Um, and so we try and make these boundaries like this is created. This is a dead hedge, so just created out of brash that we've ended up cutting back um, around the site. And even when we do have to buy in stuff for fences, a lot of it is things like chestnut paling or hazel uh, hurdling, which is made from sort of sustainable coppice woods. Um, it's sort of usually, ideally as locally as possible, it's quite a lot that comes from Kent. Um, and just again, sort of keeping those traditions going, then instead of buying a plastic boat to maintain our ponds, we thought, right, let's make a traditional coracle. So sometimes it's looking back to those older techniques for the more sort of sustainable solutions. You know, we can make this out of willow instead of plastic. Um, and uh, in some of the sessions that we do with the volunteers, we might actually again look at traditional methods and think, well, can we make string? And this might not just be a little bit of fun, but show people that it's actually quite a lot of effort to make nettle string um, and hopefully make people value those resources that seem so simple and every day a little bit more. Um, and sort of looking to the future rather than looking at those um, more traditional methods, then 
we're going to be doing quite a lot of work around the grounds. And one of the things that we're particularly looking at is the soil. So when the gardens were first set up, quite a lot of soil was imported onto the site. But we've decided this isn't what we want to do this time. We want to work with the soil that we've got. Um, and so it's not fantastic. It's quite nutrient rich. It's got bits of old car park in it. Um, some of it is currently paving. And we're using quite high tech techniques to correct to turn paving slabs into actual stuff that you can grow things in. Um, and then just looking at the sort of everyday things that we do. So um, when we have our tea break, we've got us, we ask people to bring their own mugs in or we've got a selection of uh, odd mismatched mugs that we've got from charity shops or their rejects from the uh, Natural History Museum shop. Um, we've got a composting loo that people are happy to use. It's a wooden building. Um, we try and use minimal heating. We've had a lot of talk recently about whether or not we should be using there's a wood burner in there and we're kind of questioning as more research comes out on um how even filtered wood burners which as it is you know should we actually be using that at all um and and just sort of overall it's a really joyful place to be and i think that's a really important thing to show that having doing low impact activities um, ones that work with nature, ones that see nature as what you're trying to benefit, um, can be like really happy. It doesn't have to be this kind of miserable denial where you're just kind of denied all uh, luxuries. Um, it's just that those luxuries might be something slightly, slightly different. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I'll pass over to Susan. We've got a, a couple of minutes left. Just going to ask you, Sylvia, we have a question again from Lauren asking about the numbers of volunteers. You said there's 25 volunteers on the site. Is that a deliberate sort of a COVID measure or is it to do with the, your capacity for managing volunteers? Um, at the moment, we're keeping it quite small because um, we're going to be doing quite a big grounds um, program where there will be quite a lot of kind of landscape works happening around the grounds and so we'll be able to run all the volunteer days that we'd like to um but once those grounds works are finished in a couple of years time we're planning on expanding the volunteer program so it'll probably be a few more than that doing practical work because there'll be more grounds that they can work on um and we'll also have lots of opportunities for um many more education volunteers in the grounds um and try and create a sort of integrated program so that people can mix the practical staff, the wildlife recording and the education activities. And just one more quickly before we move on. Um, it, it seems like a really well thought through range of things that you're doing. I love the idea of even trying to make the, the nettle string. I think that's fantastic. Like it's much more complicated than it seems. I was thinking, yes, it really probably is. And um, how have you integrated that kind of thinking into all of your policies because it does seem like you've done a really good job of integrating green ideas into every facet of your volunteering program has that been a bit of a struggle to get through to others in your organization um i think i mean people so in terms of the, the wildlife garden is it's it is a little bit kind of separate but it's becoming more integrated, which is this, um, the big sort of urban nature project. And that's where the kind of, the knowledge we've got from the wildlife garden is spreading. So the urban nature project will do changes on grounds, but it's also got a whole international, uh, whole international national program, working with lots of other museums around the country. It's got a national education program and we get lots of people who are working more directly in the urban nature program come to, to me and Tom say, um, hey, uh, have you got a good idea for getting X into schools or X into this program that we're doing, this community program? Um, so, uh, so that Urban Nature Project is really good for sort of spreading those, spreading those ideas around both within the museum and um, wider than that. 
It's really great to hear that cross pollination is happening with sustainability ideas. That's superb. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rosie. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, another wonderfully interesting presentation. Thank you so much. So tea break time now. Everyone will be pleased to hear. We'll get a cuppa. Vanessa is going to pop the link to Mentimeter in the chat again, um, just in case that has uh, dropped down your screen. We've got a bit of activity going on on Mentimeter. Please do have a click on the link, add some questions for the panel, click on vote on the ones that you like that are already coming up. Um, and if you don't want to click on the Mentimeter link and use that, please um, pop it into the chat now, just put a wee M at the start and Susan can put that onto Mentimeter on your behalf um, if that is easier. So tea break now and we'd see everyone back here please for 11.45 and we will be hearing from Susan O'Connor who will be talking about micro volunteering. So we'll see you all at 11.45. Hello and welcome back after our second tea break. Um, so next up, we have Susan O'Connor. Susan is one of the co-organizers of today's event and will be exploring if micro-volunteering in heritage is a sustainable future of volunteering. Susan has been director of the Scottish Civic Trust since June 2018. Since taking up the post, she has led the development of the Trust's My Place Mentoring Scheme for organisations looking to take on their own heritage project and the diverse heritage programme where the Trust seeks out and engages with hard to reach groups through heritage in an effort to increase and broaden Scotland's sense of civic identity and pride. Susan previously worked for the Princess Regeneration Trust as their Scotland advisor. She holds an ar architectural history PhD on the subject of Scottish town halls, as well as degrees in building conservation, art history and town planning. Hello and welcome to this talk on micro volunteering. My name is Dr. Susan O'Connor and I'm the director of the Scottish Civic Trust. And today I'm just going to give you a brief run through micro volunteering, what it is and how it works and how it might be useful for your organisation. So without further ado, let's switch over to the um, presentation. So micro volunteering heritage. Is it the sustainable future of volunteering or is it not worthwhile at all? Let's have a little look and see and have a think about it. First of all, micro volunteering. Well, it's bite sized volunteering with no commitment to repeat and with minimum formality involving short and specific actions that are quick to start and quick to complete as well. That's the accepted definition of micro volunteering. And I would say that the main difference between micro volunteering and traditional volunteering is the level of responsibility and the volunteer manager. So all the usual caretaking uh, roles that the volunteer manager would take to make sure that the volunteer is having a good experience and is performing as expected, go out the window with micro-volunteering and it's much more transactional arrangement between volunteer and volunteer manager. The key attributes of micro-volunteering are the following. Duration. It's usually small parcels, parcels of time between 10 and 30 minutes, most commonly, and very rarely for a full day's commitment. That would be more in the role of a traditional volunteering opportunity. Access. It's very easy to get started and it's very easy to do. So if you can explain the job in three sentences or less, you're probably on the right track. And similarly speaking, it's very quick to get started and can be done straight away. The travel time is very short, by which I mean either the physical travel time to the destination for the volunteering or the travel time in terms of the clicks that are go that you have to go through to reach the point where you actually start the job are very, very quick and brief. Um, and indeed, the comprehension required to understand the task is, should be as, as close as possible to non-existent. It's very convenient for the volunteer because they're in complete control of when and where they do it. So they should be able to do it while they're waiting for their takeaway to arrive on the bus, on the way to or from work, perhaps waiting for somebody else to pick up their child, all of those kind of things, whatever suits them is the key attribute. So if they're somebody who likes to work in the middle of the night, there should be micro volunteering opportunities ready, willing and able for them to take part in them at that point of the day. The level of formality is very different, and I think that's a key uh, element for volunteer managers to understand. There's usually no formal agreement between the volunteer body and the volunteer that work is going to be carried out. 
and the frequency and the flexibility of the task is also key as well. So each task should be a complete unit in its own right and it should require the volunteer to return to it for its completion at any later date. The focus is very much on tasks rather than roles so that each um, the, what you're asking the person to do is specifically related to tasks to be completed rather than looking after a whole range of different tasks within a parcel of a project. And the location as well it can be either online or offline, though in reality, most of the tasks are likely to be online. So what is micro volunteering good for? Well, very good for sustainable volunteering because most of the tasks that will be suitable for micro volunteering opportunities are either hyper local or they're digital tasks. So where they are local tasks, it's because there are opportunities that work best in localities. So there's a sense of creating a more positive image of the local area and strengthening the community. So it can be things like pulling weeds out of uh, the wall of a nearby church or taking photographs of problems with buildings and sending them to the building zone or all of these kinds of things count as microvolta. And so it's very, very good for that kind of thing because they're specifically related to community benefits that are visible to all. Um, it's also very suitable in terms of digital opportunities for very remote locations where traditional volunteering is limited because of the travel distance involved to get to sites. Um, so if you can do online opportunities relating to sites that are quite remote, then it does get people engaged in a way that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And that's very good in terms of their sustainable output, but also very good for well-being for people who live in remote locations to feel like they're engaged and involved with a wider community. It's great for big non-taxing tasks. So simple tasks that are not essential to the running of the organization, but are things that will really help it in the long term to get achieved. And it's really good for reaching out for a wide variety of people, um, people who are ge geographically remote, people with access issues, young people, because the focus is on the task rather than the organization that's delivering it. So there's no potential for a sense of alienation because a particular organization is asking for it. It's simply, do you have the skill set to complete this work? It's not good for well to be fair quite a lot quite a lot it's not good for opportunities where personal care is a factor or where sustained interpersonal relationships are required for a good result it's not good for organizations who are already struggling to manage here manage their volunteers because it requires substantial management and a different skill set to what's uh, traditionally used for the skills for uh, traditional volunteering programs. It's not good for sensitive high risk tasks where um, there's a, an element of trust has to be built into the volunteer for, um, completing the task because it's so anonymous. Um, and it's not good for complex tasks, so tasks where there is um, a need for questioning and for a deeper understanding before being able to complete the task successfully. And also any task where there's a high level of perfectionism required and there's a lot riding on that perfectionism is not good for it because, again, because there's a much uh, lower level of supervision um, of the standard being achieved by our volunteers. So there can be kind of a bumpy ride in terms of the quality achieved overall. So if you had to think about all of that and you'd still like to pursue micro volunteering and um, here's how to pitch it internally be really clear about where micro volunteering opportunities will fit into the overall picture of your organization because it's not a replacement as i've been saying for traditional volunteering but it is something to add into that palette and consider the formality balance carefully and be prepared for a complete rethink about how you manage your volunteers. So all of the induction, safeguarding and sort of supervision policies that you have in place for traditional volunteering are not appropriate for micro volunteering opportunities. And as a volunteer manager, you need to be able to get beyond that expectation that that level of paperwork um, is necessary for a successful volunteering programme. Um, and also when pitching it, think about those projects that have been on the back for two years because no one says we could possibly transcribe that enormous tome of handwritten notes by so and so well this is your golden opportunity to do it and indeed people are doing that all over the globe now and um, so that's the way to pitch it if you want to get a really boring task completed but it's very very long this is the way to do it put it into little bite-sized chunks and just think about how that can benefit your organization and how you never normally get anybody to complete that task so if you decided you're, you've successfully pitched it internally and now you're considering how you're going to pitch it externally, this is sort of the framework within which to build your um, advertisement for the volunteering opportunity. 
explain what needs to be done and how long it might, it might take in three sentences or less, if you can. Use clear, informal language. Include a pitch on where this task fits into the greater good, if you can. Don't be afraid to be quite transactional in, in your approach. So can you offer a reward, for example, a key ring or free access or a free coffee at the cafe or something like that? You can frame it as a well-being exercise. So tend to take 10 minutes to feel good all day long or brand it as a sort of mindfulness exercise and explain that it's a straightforward but meaningful piece of work that can be carried out. If you have to ask for monitoring data, try and limit it to just one piece um, on what you most need to know. Remembering, of course, that you are asking for people to give you a 10 minute commitment in return for which they will get to feel good about themselves. So that doesn't really give you the opportunity to ask for much more than one piece at most of monitoring data and only if you really feel you have to do that and you should be if it's an online opportunity you should be able to pull some data analytics anyway to explain exactly who it is who's accessing your opportunities so bearing that in mind here are some sample texts there on the right hand side you'll see there's a um, uh, an actual real life uh, example of a micro volunteering opportunity taken from the American Science Universe um, of a transcription exercise. And here is my own example using the Scottish example on the left hand side. And that's to correct our best guess at reading articles from the 1920s. Five Cultural Trust is creating a fully accessible newspaper, newspaper archive and we need your help to do it correct five of our text sections for free access to our new exhibition. So that's just one way of considering how you might phrase it. And um, you can go for a more straightforward one there on, on the right-hand side, you can see they're, they're pushing forward with the idea of this being a very significant set of notebooks. And that's a different approach again. You need to decide what your most, uh, your best selling point is if you have um, a really significant, if you have a known name um, who needs some research then that's possibly the best way to go forward. Otherwise, it's about uh, other aspects that you can draw in to make your opportunity really attractive to people. So just some reflections, more broadly speaking, on the idea of micro-volunteering. It's part of a, a cultural shift way physical participation as being the greater, greatest marker of value within heritage and engagement. Our entire Doors Open Day programme this last year was, in fact, digital, and 75% of our audience was new, which really reflects the capacity of uh, digital engagement to draw in new audiences into heritage, which is just so important for the sector. Um, but it does start to beg the question about the relative importance of 2D and 3D experiences and whether it, we can view um, people viewing things only as in 2D as, as having the same qualities of experience as, as, a, as a in real life experience. And I think that's a more broad question to ask yourself about how that works for you. I think it's probably best suited for the nice to have rather than the essential tasks. Um, and it, it should fit within a palette of opportunities rather than a standalone opportunity. But if you really have a need as an organization to start producing volunteering opportunities that take cognizance of the climate crisis, and if you want to pass out your palette of opportunities that are uh, of opportunities from very resource heavy traditional ones with something more light touch, then it's absolutely ideal for you. So just find me some uh, micro volunteering tasks that you could consider. Creating infographics from a list of data provided, tagging building images, for example, or object images, transcribing text from scanned images, checking OCR reading of scanned images, tracing a building image or an object in image to create a coloring in drawing to be printed off and used in real life, or potentially this is a slightly longer one, uh, creating a simple knitting pattern for a building that can also be shared online as well. Offline examples might be weeding beds on the way to the bus stop or taking record photographs of sites in your area for the buildings at risk register. There are a whole range of other things that will spring to mind, but those are just some really straightforward ones to, to, to get the cogs turning, so to speak. So I hope that's been helpful for you. If you'd like some further reading, here are some great resources. So do feel free to access those. Uh, and I hope you've uh, enjoyed today's talk. Thank you very much for your, um, your participation today. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Susan. So instead of Susan asking herself her own questions, <laughs> I will ask some here that have come through the chat. Um, and one's actually uh, from myself. So do you think 
micro volunteering is particularly popular with people who live in a different country to where the volunteering is actually making its contribution because obviously it's it's really nice sort of opens up that international stage in terms of engagement I think it's quite underdeveloped in the UK, but I think when you look at the examples abroad in America and in Australia, there is sort of a diaspora type involvement um, from people who live far away, but are potentially ethnically from somewhere else or have distant relations in a different country. And I think it's something that in Scotland, particularly, we haven't taken advantage of as yet. Um, with the Scottish Civic Trust, we've been trialing involvement with Tartan Week as part of Doors Open Days to try and build those connections with other countries. And I think that is definitely an area we, where we could look to push things more fully. Um, but I think we have to be careful about trying to reach those audiences because, you know, where is the benefit for that? Um, most people encourage volunteering, let's be blunt, as a means of showing to funders that there is a need for their building or their site or their objects. Um, most funders aren't interested in international appeal because it doesn't directly hit their KPIs, their key performance indicators. So I wouldn't be going to great efforts to engage them, but I think we could certainly do much better at publicizing those opportunities through international media portals, so, such as Facebook and Twitter, and more likely Instagram as well. Okay, great, thank you. And we've got a question from Megan. Can you share the resources for micro volunteering again? So is there any resources that can be maybe emailed out to participants through Eventbrite after this yeah, event? Yeah, absolutely, that that's no problem. We can send those out. Okay, great. So we'll do that for everybody. And um, we've got a comment here from Catherine Cartmel. I was a funding volunteer for a charity in Malawi. There were volunteers from across the world fundraising locally. Um, wonderful. And Craig Ferguson um, from NTS. With lots of dispersed micro tasks, how do you keep a track of outputs and outcomes to show uh, traction overall? And for those who like figures, um, annual reports, etc., in terms of numbers of volunteers and time they've spent doing micro volunteering tasks. That's why it's really important to create the sort of closed off tasks so you can say X number of tasks were completed. So if you look at one of the sites that I had shown there, what they do is they show you the, the, the task that, that's to be completed, how many micro tasks within that task there are to, for it to be completed and how many have been completed to date. Using one of those portals is quite easy to keep track of them. It's a bit like Google Analytics. So you can go into the back of house and just read those off for reports. And um, it's not always possible to tell how much time people have taken. Uh, and again, it goes back to sort of changing your idea of what your reportables necessarily might be from uh, this type of volunteering. It'll be quite different from your standard volunteering. So in terms of in, instead of reporting back on time spent by volunteers, you might be reporting back on geographic location and the number of repeat tasks they've completed rather than the individual slots of time on the project. OK, great. Thanks. And worth noting, we've got a complimentary workshop coming up from Team Kinetic about um, developing digital volunteering opportunities. So there's another exactly. question in here. Um, do you find there are particular ages groups that are more inclined to be involved in micro volunteering? How can we encourage um, SENDS groups to participate? So it's very much um, for people, younger folk in particular, um, using um, things like Instagram, it's really good for getting them out there. Um, but also we find that people who have had access difficulties in particular over the last 18 months, it's good for them to, to be able to, to hook up for even just sort of the 20 minutes a day and feel like they're involved in projects. You'll get people who are, get really, really into it and will, and will complete multiple tasks, but will never darken your door. Um, and they're kind of the interesting subgroup because they're the people who are uh, who don't engage otherwise. So you've got a sort of a subgroup there, but really it depends on how you pitch your project. And I'll go back, I'll go back to that again and again and again. It doesn't really matter what your organization is. What matters is what opportunity you're offering. And that has to be front and center. Really nobody cares where you're from if you're offering them something interesting to do that's going to make them feel like they're contributing even if it's just for that 10 minutes a day absolutely great thank you and just for everybody um if you haven't had a look in the chat it's worth having a wee look now lindsay shared some notes there on be my eyes and um, they've got volunteers for over 150 plus countries over 5 million volunteers um okay so we're going to move on to the workshops now unless there's anything else that you want to add susan nope 
Nope. OK, great. And any other questions um, that have just been popped into the uh, chat, please head over to Mentimeter. If, Vanessa, if you can pop the link to Mentimeter once again into the chat, just so it's at the top, that would be great. And please add them in. So time for the workshops now. So we have two workshops. I'll just read out a wee description of the workshops and then uh, talk about the joining instructions. So workshop one will focus on developing digital volunteering opportunities and is led by Chris Martin, Managing Director with Team Kinetic. Team Kinetic have been developing volunteer management software for 14 years, driven by their mission to make volunteering easier for everyone. With over 250,000 volunteers using their product and 1 million hours of volunteering delivered in the past 12 months, Team Kinetic is excited and really proud to be supporting Make Your Mark. Workshop two will focus on taking climate action and is led by Vanessa Glendamere, Responsible Tourism Coordinator with Historic Environment Scotland and one of my colleagues. She is a background in heritage and cultural tourism management and has been involved in the delivery of the ADAPT Northern Heritage Project which includes multiple internal stakeholder workshops and looked at climate impacts to the historic environment and developing corresponding adaption measures. Today, she will guide us through a brainstorming session on identifying ideas for climate action, barriers and potential solutions. And the resources that are shared within workshop too, they'll be emailed out. And the idea is that you can then take them away, use those resources with your own volunteers, on a personal note, with your friends, your family, with other groups that you engage with. So it's about us now today here in this session, but the idea is that it can have a wider reach. My name is Chicken Tommy Busy Day, and I hope that what I'm able to share with you today will be useful. And uh, no matter where you are on your sort of digital journey right now, we appreciate the uh, sector is going through something of a tech revolution right now. Uh, some of that has been driven by COVID, uh, and it's definitely speeded us up. And it's forced organisations to revisit how they deliver services. And um, a lot of organisations have seen digital as the, the answer, rightly or wrongly. We, we will discuss some of that stuff in today's session. Um, I'm just going to move my... Uh, so I can see what's on the screen. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about Team Kinetic and why we think about something useful to share with you guys. Up on the slide is what Team Kinetic software aims to do and how it makes your life and that of your volunteers a little bit easier. We've been operating for 13 years, and during that time, we've been lucky enough to work directly with over 200 organizations and support over 35,000 opportunity providers. Some have been tiny, and some of them have been national brands that uh, I'm sure you're aware of. And the reason we're here today is because of the work we've been doing, Make Your Mark. And it's through that partnership that's uh, sort of enabled this conversation today. Team Kinetic has over 250,000 registered volunteers across the UK. And uh, we deliver over a we, well, last year we delivered over a million hours of volunteering, which is amazing during the middle of the pandemic. Uh, in today's session, I aim to explain to you how to decide on what digital tools may be useful for your organisation, how to use digital to effectively re-engage and recruit, and how to retain volunteers and gain the trust of your stakeholders, and why we think digital is great for sustainability. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the pitfalls and mistakes that can be made when transitioning to a digital product. And what we've learned over the last few years of doing this and there might be a bit of time at the end for a little bit of uh q a so if you have any questions please feel free to pop them in the um in the in the uh, chat box so i'm just gonna jump onto my next oh come on too far there we go so so rosie and erin first approached us uh from make your mark uh, in the midst of the second lockdown. And uh, as a concept, it was one his way when we first started talk to, to, talking to the guys uh, about Make Your Mark. But they'd identified really early on there were some issues around how they were going to effectively manage a campaign in which they were going to recruit volunteers and try and broaden the participation in the heritage sector. It had been identified that as we came out of COVID, there was going to be a number of heritage-based organisations, especially some of the small ones, that lost a significant number of the volunteers. And Make Your Mark was designed to help them attract new volunteers and bring new, and, and a wider audience into heritage. Um, and to make, more, make heritage volunteering more accessible and more inclusive, 
their lofty goals, even on a you know during normal times, never mind in the middle of a pandemic. So, what are the what are the big challenges pre pre digital, if we will? Uh, the big one for Make Your Mark is how could they list all their heritage opportunities in it from all these different sources in in one place and make it easy to search what was going on near near volunteers and what was going on in their world near them as as individuals. Uh, can we link to existing national services like uh, Volunteer Scotland and the TSI network? How can we make it easier for all of heritage organisations to have access to the very best digital tools to enable them to better engage their volunteers? And how can we make it easier to track volunteers through registration, to becoming volunteers, uh, and then on to actually, you know, their, their, their life cycle, if you will, as a long, a long term volunteer, uh, without it turning into a massive job that was, a, that was problematic in terms of a volunteer management, keeping on top of all that. And the big part of, uh, a big part of me, you might, how do you attract a wider audience, you know, younger volunteers or volunteers from a different uh, space to where you're attracting them from right now? You know, how can digital act as a gateway and make it easier for volunteers to get involved? So the business case for change is pretty strong, and the the big state, the big decision for Erin and Rosie at the time when they first started looking at uh, Make Your Mark was picking the right product to make sure they had the appropriate support in place to help them launch something that would enable the and uh, facilitate the uh, the sector to to relaunch volunteering to some extent. The the approach that Make Your Mark took was uh, it didn't rely on expensive expensive consultants or overly complicated procurement processes. They set out a series of questions they could judge each of the products they looked at. Uh, and it, the first one was, is it right for my needs? They developed a list of must-have features and nice-to-have features, and that started the base of their specification. Is it affordable? Are there limits on the number of volunteers you could sign up, the number of opportunities you could post, the number of administrators you could have? Were all the features they needed included, or did, was there additional extras they weren't aware of? Was there any? Was it off the shelf, or was there a uh, bespoke nature to the product they were going to build? Was the product going to mitigate the risks that they faced? You know, it could be GDPR, it could be working with vulnerable people and safeguarding, it could be a particularly challenging physical environment. Was was the product they chose to engage with going to help them mitigate some of those risks? Was it a UK-based product? So did it have UK-based support, 24-hour telephone support, ticketing, uh, support ticketing, the chat feature, uh, a whole range of different support features that enabled the, the users to make sure they were, felt like they were well looked after. Was the solution future-proof? Were the updates included? Did they have to pay for extra and ongoing maintenance? They really wanted a product that was going to stay on trend with tech. And always the problem when you're looking at te technology products is, you buy something and three years down the line, it's out of date and making sure you had something that was, was going to keep up to date with the, the ongoing trends in technology. Could the product be integrated into their existing technologies? Uh, will it talk to their existing software and will it play nice to what they've already got? And is it a proven solution? Were other people already using it? Could they ask other people they knew about how well this product worked? Make your mark working with ourselves at Team Kinetic we were lucky enough that we were selected as the product of choice. And, you know, if you've not signed up for it as yet, then we, we do suggest strongly that you go away and sign up and, and join Make Your Mark. It's an amazing campaign that they're running across Scotland to get more volunteers involved in volunteering. But as the list that came above there, we were lucky enough that we were selected based on that criteria. And Team Genetic provided everything that they were looking for. And a little bit more. So we've worked with team, we've worked with the guys that make your mark to help them develop and get the site spe specifically to help to their needs sorry and we've developed a range of videos and workshops and there'll be some there'll be some comms going out after this event where we're looking to engage more um, opportunity providers to sign up to make your mark and hopefully grow a real um, community around heritage volunteering now I'd like to talk a little bit about how the product actually helps with uh, the way you manage your volunteers. And right now, I'm pretty sure at the top of everybody's uh, agenda is this idea about re-engaging volunteers. Uh, I know it's pretty much uh, the, the, the big sort of, the, the elephant in the room, if, we, if you will. Um, so the first thing, it really helps understand why your volunteers might be a little bit reluctant to return. And unfortunately, I don't have a technological answer to that 
there's no getting away from the fact you have to get to know your volunteers, talk to your volunteers and find out how they feel, what their worries are and really get into that. And COVID without a doubt has seen all the volunteers more adversely affected than younger volunteers. And rightly, many are nervous about returning to roles that may have an element that's public facing. We've also seen over the last few years, a consistent trend that started way before COVID to be fair of more young people volunteering. Now that's interesting because the kind of commitment that you get from young people is different to what you would see from your traditional volunteers. It tends to be shorter and more informal. And it makes it hard for organizations like yourself that listen to this to plan when you have that kind of volunteer that may not be as committed to you as what you've been used to in the past. So I guess the big thing is how can digital help with all these problems? Firstly, you have to find an offer that ensures your volunteers uh, you are nervous to return you know, you, they, feel enabled, they feel comfortable to, to come back. Now, that, that offer may involve things like micro-volunteering, as uh, Susan was talking about previously. It might involve virtual volunteering. There's a whole range of different ways you can offer volunteering opportunities. Maybe a little bit different to what you've done in the past. Volunteer managers are going to have to be a little bit creative to find new jobs and roles. So with the change in expectations of volunteers, you might also want to offer maybe taster sessions so volunteers can try and see how they feel about returning. To an opportunity in a controlled environment to see if they're comfortable in that that new environment we suggest using tools like sms text messages and instant messaging via whatsapp as it gets a much more instant response than maybe using emails or uh, traditional sort of methods of communication you may also use your phone to create things like short videos that volunteers can watch and it shows you how you're keeping them safe when they're they're in your venues Make sure your messaging explains not only what you need uh, from the volunteer, but how, what, you've gone, what you've gone on to do to keep that volunteer safe when they're in your venue. And make it clear that without the volunteer's help, you'll not be able to provide the service you're looking for. It, I, can't, I can't overestimate enough. Our data shows it very, very, very clearly. Feeling needed can't be underestimated it's as to the impact on a volunteer's desire to get involved and keep going back. Re-engaging is going to take time. It rely on strong messaging and consistent messaging, and it's going to rely on a little bit of creative thinking on the part of volunteer managers. But we hope digital tools like Make Your Mark can help spread the message you have to your volunteers. It can also significantly reduce the cost per opportunity for these new types of opportunities, digital opportunities, these virtual opportunities, micro opportunities, as that it, these, uh, an online product like uh, Make Your Mark and Team Kinetic is really good at those kind of opportunities. And generating a sense of safety and a clear message of we need your help. You know, that is really, you can use social media, you can use your opportunities, you can use your advertising, you can use all the tools that are built into Make Your Mark to help you sell that message to your volunteers. So when it comes to recruiting new volunteers, we've learned some, we've learned some interesting lessons over the last 13 years. It's important to recognize the difference between registrations, we think, and volunteers. And a digital system makes it easy to make new registrations, but doesn't necessarily always convert to volunteers. What we, what we refer to as conversions, we tend to see a conversion rate across our sites of about 24 to about 35%, depending on the customer and the audience. What we see is digital tends to attract a younger audience. And some of our customers have, have reported a, an 11 year drop in their average age of volunteers. You can also gain some really interesting insight into the type of volunteer you, att you attract and the kind of return on investment you get from that volunteer. And this allows you to make better strategic decisions about your volunteer investment. You know, where you're going to put your energy, be it, uh, where you, you know, your budget goes when it comes to recruiting. Using a system like Team Kinetic and Make Your Mark, communications can be tailored, individualized, and automated. You need to be where your volunteers are. So social media, if you're talking to younger volunteers, is where it's at. And you can play, make really pretty posts that really talk to your audience. And then you can't really beat good old-fashioned volunteer management with posters, flyers, uh, you know, word of mouth, building a little audience with your own volunteers. You know, that is the key to, that is work for millennia and it's going to keep on working. And what we're able to do with a product like Team Kinetic and with uh, Make Your Mark is make it easier to do those things, to create really pretty flyers and create really nice posters. And then finally, the great thing about technology is the ability to share seamlessly, share your, share your opportunities with services like Volunteer Scotland and the TSI network and Volunteer Wales as the work we do. Uh, we're also working with Do It in, uh, in the UK as well to 
to look at how we can grow our audience to these other platforms. Digital will help you reduce your cost of each recruitment. It'll automate and customize your communications or save you time. And promoting opportunities across multiple platforms gets easier and easier when these platforms are interoperable. Old school PDFs go a long way to making sure you always have a really good looking uh, set of resources to give you to your volunteers. And using tools like email invites makes it really easy for your volunteers to get involved and sign up. So there's, there's a whole range of making sure your volunteers can, can get engaged with what you're doing. Now, re a retained volunteer is definitely the best type of volunteer. And COVID has inevitably had an impact on almost every organization that relies on volunteers. People's lives have changed in the last 20 months, and some may never return uh, to, to volunteering as it was before, although return in a slightly different way. Volunteer managers have a real challenge on their hands in helping volunteers to feel confident and safe whilst in your venues. But it's also a, a real opportunity for those volunteer managers who've got the courage to try something new, to evolve their offer, to find new ways for volunteers to serve their organisations. What can you deliver digitally? Can you use Zoom, Team, Google Meet, WhatsApp? What can volunteers do from home? Keyboard warriors, social media Jedi, online befrienders, digital archivers, the list goes on. And Susan touched on a lot of that previously in the, uh, in the micro-volunteering conversation prior to this session. How can we use these digital tools to make volunteering more sustainable moving forwards? We've got a couple of things I want to talk about that I think really helps when it comes to retaining your volunteers. And I'm going to start with a really important one and what we think is most important, which is giving your volunteers agency. Giving volunteers ownership of their profiles, of their volunteering more widely, this empowers your volunteers. It reduces your workload as a volunteer manager if volunteers can get on and do stuff for themselves. And that whole idea of self-serve and self-manage is fundamental for us in terms of a sustainable volunteer offer. Allow your volunteers the space to be amazing. And, you know, let, you know as I say, if you love them, let them, let them go, let them go free. Give people what they want. Offer a variety of opportunities types that meets the tastes and needs of your volunteer audience. If you can make an opportunity flexible, i.e. they can do it when and where it suits them on their timetable. You can look at micro-volunteering where the commitment is minimal and the onboarding is almost zero. You can make it virtual. They can do it from the comfort of their own sofa or via the mobile phone. And appreciate the transactional nature of volunteering. Volunteers have a, a massive range of motivations for why they end up with you. Give the volunteer the opportunity to, to understand what's in it for them, the benefits they're going to get out of the volunteering. Make your mark and team kinetics really, our big, our big piece of work is enabling all those kind of opportunity types, giving the freedom to our opportunity providers to create opportunities that, that talk to the audience we're trying to attract. Recognition is absolutely essential to retention. Motivate your volunteers with instant feedback and personalise where you say thank you. Send your volunteers a virtual thumbs up, big old thumbs up there, and let them know you appreciate them. Let them know they're making a difference and that you need them there to carry on with their good work to keep your service going. As volunteer managers, we sometimes forget that volunteers don't always appreciate how special and important they are. And one of the key things with a tool like Team Kinetic and Make Your Mark is making it easy to remind them how, how amazing your volunteers are. Communication all plays into this. When it comes to communication, volunteers don't want to be bombarded with pointless comms. They don't want a million and one emails. You want a system that lets you volunteer, select and set preferences about what they want to hear about. You want to keep your volunteers up to date and in the loop about what you've got going on and the difference they're making. That's really key. And you want to be able to do that by creating really pretty emails, uh, you know, and be able to send that to subgroups and groups of your volunteers. Using a combination of emails, newsletters, opportunity adverts, SMS texts, all these things, you know, will help you create a, um, a sense of belonging, a sense of ownership for your volunteers. Volunteering inherently social. So we try and create tools in there that let volunteers talk to volunteers, a little chat feature, and letting volunteers talk to each other is a great thing. There's no silver bullet to retention. I wish I, I wish I knew what that silver bullet was, but what you want to do is create an environment where people feel valued and they're amongst friends and it makes it really hard for them to leave or anything like that. In terms of realizing potential, to sustain your volunteer offer, you need to be able to provide, you need to be able to prove 
what different job volunteers are making and, and be able to create a, a narrative, if you will, and tell some stories that help sell your volunteer program. And your volunteer management tool should help you do that. You want all your data in one place, get your, all your volunteer information in a single source, be able to filter that information, be able to create communication groups and, and filter by um, skill level, for example, follow up who's signed up and their, their onboarding journey, create rotors, shifts and events, use maps, reports, all that kind of stuff that we want to use the data to grow and make a difference. So very, very uh, quickly, just to pull some conclusions from what we've talked about today. We've yeah, covered a lot of stuff. Chris, we're oh. just overrunning, just to let you know, so that obviously people, we need to be back in the main session at 12.30. Okay. So if you can uh, do a wrap-up, that would be wonderful. Uh, yeah, I've got one minute to go, no problem. So we've covered a lot of ground, and hopefully, uh, you know, the role of data and all that kind of stuff is really help, but helpful, but digital will change the way you can work, and you should be able to support more volunteers more easily. It should provide you a solid basis for good volunteer governance, and it should supercharge your ability to communicate with your volunteers effectively. It should also allow you to become more creative and finally to have a better and deeper level of in insight about your volunteer program. And that really is what we're all about. We want you to be able to offer more volunteering to more people and make it easier for those guys to do the things that they love to do and make a difference to your organisations. And that's pretty much my time because I'm, I've got a couple more things to say, but that's pretty much me out of time. So thank you for giving me uh, your attention and hopefully uh, that was useful for you. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Re really appreciate that. And I think the one key message as well, as we've learned already today, as we heard it from Lindsay in her presentation, we're green because if you go digital, then the other be beautiful thing is we are green because it's less paper. Exactly. All right. I've just posted the link for, to get back into the main room again. If you want to use that, hopefully you've got one minute to use the bathroom and grab yourself a drink. But uh, no, Rose is really keen to start us again at 1230. But thanks again, Chris. Really insightful. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. OK, so Vanessa, who have you got that is supporting you today from HES, just so we know? I've got my wonderful colleague Marzina with me. Yeah. Okay. So she's she's ready to rock. There's Ms. Marzina. Hi. Great. Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay, fab. So I am going to pass it over to Vanessa G. Vanessa, I'm staying in this session. So anything that you need from me, just shout out, but I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for having me and thank you and good afternoon to everyone um, for joining me and um, for this Taking Climate Action Workshop. Um, as Rosie was saying, we'll, we'll identify and develop ideas for climate action that you can take in your projects, in your workplace, anywhere really. It's really, really versatile. Um, and we'll also have a look at potential challenges that we all face wanting to do certain things um, and maybe one or two solutions um, crop up as well. Um, it's just a, a nice environment um, to, to share our experiences and pass it on. Um, before we dive into the workshop, Rosie's mentioned it before as well, we will make those resources available and um, we'll be using a Miro board today and I'll, before we, we, we dive into that, I'll um, talk you through how to use it, just a couple of um, key points um, that will hopefully make, make using it a bit easier for you all. And um, yeah, as, as Rosie mentioned, the um, HS Communities website will host um, those resources, but they will also be emailed out to you. Um, once um, the session is over, over the coming few weeks. Um, so it really is a versatile tool and you'll hopefully see that what we're doing today can be taken into community groups, into workplaces, any, anywhere um, you want um, to, to brainstorm. And um, I'm now going to start sharing my screen um, so we can all have a look at Miro together. Um, here we go. Let me check. I've got two screens, so I'll need to be sure to share the right one. Here we go. Um, you should now be able to see the Miro board. Um, do give me a shout um, if you can see my notes instead of it. Um, but basically, um, this is what it's going to look like. Um, as I said, we're going to um, suss out ideas, challenges and solutions. Um, when you, my, my colleague Marzina will share the link with you shortly um but basically once you once you click on the link it'll take you to this board um it might be that you're zoomed out really really far and kind of cannot see a thing um easy solution will be to zoom in with the wheel on your mouse or the usual sort of like 
hand move on, on a laptop. Um, if you are on a mobile phone or a, any sort of uh, mobile device, actually, um, you may struggle to get in. You'll have to, it'll, it'll ask you to download an app. Do not worry about that. If you don't want to download the app, just leave your comments with like indicating whether it's an idea, a challenge or a solution in the chat. And again, Marzena will pick them out from there and we'll populate them onto the, um, onto the board. I'll continue to share my screen and just have to dive out, out of um, the picture really shortly um, because my um, charger has just discharged itself. Um, but here we go, um, all back on track. Um, so yes, Marzena was going to pull everything across. Um, if you move the cursor over a certain area that you want to have a closer look at, again, you can zoom in through that, zoom out again. And um, for today's session, we'll be using um, sticky notes, which you'll find on the left hand side of the screen. You can click on it, you can choose your favorite color. Let's make this as colorful as possible. Um, so it's going to be nice and easy to look at. Favorite color is green. Um, so you'll see that your cursor has changed into a little sticky note icon. Again, scroll in, tap it, and you'll see that it has populated it. Um, and then you'll see the, the usual sort of bar indicating that it's ready to be written on and we can see whatever we want to see on here and um, you can go back in and delete or change anything that you want now um similar to, to the whole session really this is a really nice environment to share knowledge to share expertise it's a safe space please be kind to each other please be um considerate when you when you put post-it notes down um there's no right or wrong or anything odd that you could um like there's there's not going to be any judgment at all um so please use this as a safe space if you feel like you're going to post something where you might want someone else to get in touch with you afterwards or to kind of continue to develop ideas do include your name because like when, if you see if i put this on here um it'll be totally anonymous which is can be a good thing um however if you do want to someone to get in touch or or um, feel like um, you want to follow up with anyone and um, do feel free to put your name in brackets behind it that's absolutely no problem at all I see um, there's more and more cursors following us so most of you will have found um, the Miro board again also please feel free to to click on a few things test it out and um, get comfortable with it um, and then, I mean, we've heard loads and loads of inspiring um, presentations today already, giving us ideas of what is possible um, in, in, in the world of volunteering um, and in the, in, in the world of um, climate action as well, to, to a degree. Um, there are some inspirations we've left here. Um, so when we're talking about climate action, um, we're talking about reducing energy, switching to renewables, um, saving water, plastic reduction and waste reduction, particularly food waste is a huge thing. So if you feel event, like if there's anything um, that you would want to try out with your volunteers or have done already, so this can be ideas of what you want to do in the future. It can also be like, oh, this has worked really, really well for me. Um, or maybe you've run something and you ran into a little problem and you, you want to know if, if anyone knows a solution for it. Um, again, pop that on a post-it node. Um, and also what's going to help throughout the session is if you use, like if you have an idea and a corresponding challenge, if you then just pop the um, post-it nodes on the sort of same level in the ideas and in the challenges section, um, but you can also use on the left hand side, you've got this little connection line and um, you can use that to say this is the idea, this is the challenge and you can then connect them. Now I know I'm going to delete this again because it wasn't, um, but just just to show. Um, more than happy to, to um, have a verbal discussion as well if you feel if you spot anything you want to follow up on it. Um, I'm going to keep a keep an eye on what's been said. So I'm going to moderate you through this. Um, but yeah, just a safe space to, to exchange ideas um, and to, to have a look at what challenges we face and the possible solutions. Um, so no one joined this to hear me blabbering away. Um, I'm going to um, be quiet now for a bit and then we'll have a look at what has come up. It's really, really busy already, really loads of post-it notes um, 
been stuck on the on the whiteboard already, which is fantastic. Vanessa, um, I've got a quick question, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Just, I mean, and I think as well, you know, we're all in a workshop situation here, too, so if you're just happy to take live questions as we go oh, along, of observations and such, will Absolutely. the content um, of this ideas, challenges, and solutions will these be written up that we can email out along with, um, you know, how to run this workshop with your own groups? Yeah, what we would have done is like we can turn this into a PDF, so we can actually save a more or less a screenshot of um of the whiteboard that we create today and um, so that can be definitely shared and um, going forward that's why i was also saying if, if anyone feels like they want to follow up or um want to offer that someone gets in touch with them and um, to do include the name so that they can okay. pick it up on great so we don't all have to be furiously scribbling notes oh, with no. other people's <laughs> ideas and such so that that'll be sent out through eventbrite with the with the other resources great okay yes, thank you yeah. for confirming that no problem Thanks. at all and yes, of course, like any any questions anyone has, any comments, um, do just unmute yourselves um, and go ahead. I really like the one someone's put there. Create a theme for the year's volunteering or use the National Year of um, to encourage climate activity. I think it'd be wonderful, you know, next year, obviously, Scotland's Year of Stories. And if they're, and, and maybe it's already in the pipeline, I can't recall if there's one after Year of Stories has already been programmed in. Don't know if anyone knows that. Um, but yeah, if there's a, a climate, you know, climate action themed year, that'd be wonderful. Hmm. Absolutely, but in, and even if and you could almost put a spin on the year of stories next year and make it a year of climate stories. Very yeah, important. I, I put a question in Mentimeter about that actually <laughs> about activity for year of stories for next year. So perfect. Hi, KSB, we've actually already done that. Um, Rosie, we've created a year of stories that's going to be connected to our. Um, um, this year we had a theme that was climate and nature emergency. So next year we're asking them to do their stories about what they did during the, the year of climate and nature emergency to keep the kind of climate theme going for another year. Well, that sounds great. And and we've been mulling over in this event team in terms of the knowledge share um, for our programme for next year with Make Your Mark. And should we do event an event about engaging volunteers through storytelling as part of your stories to do with um you know important themes messages etc climate change and other things so um yeah might might yeah. follow up with you katie <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it's maybe a different way of engaging a slightly different audience yeah yeah, yeah. I also really like the, the comment about embedding volunteering as part of the climate strategy in an organization, um, because I think like it, it really sits well within that and you can um, volunteering has got such great power um, to to get things moving. Um, so if, if that sits within the climate strategy of an organization, I see that um, going going really far. There's another interesting one about funding as well. Um, you know, obviously, um, uh, a lot of funding pots open to to climate change, and and it's about understanding the ones that also support volunteering as one of the funding indicators. It almost looks like we're running out of space. On the, <laughs> there's so many great ideas here. <laughs> But yeah, if you because I see some um, really, really huge post it notes, the, the further you zoom in, the better you'll be able to see things. So the smaller you can, you can make the post it notes so they don't all, all have to be like humongous. 
just in case we're kind of like trying to, to stay within if we're, if we're running out of space. Vanessa, can I just check in the interest of uh, time, is there a second, is there another part to the workshop after we've done some work on Miro or is it, is it about no, doing these and then just, recording it? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, okay. that's, um, yeah. Okay. Do you mind telling us a little bit about the other resources? I think there's a carbon calculator spreadsheet that's going to get emailed out as well. Is that right? Um, yes, that was, um, our colleague Katie Carter, um, Circular Economy Projects Officer, who's developed a, a carbon calculator for, for travel. So you can, um, it's, it's a simple to use Excel spreadsheet. Um, you just punch in how, like the distance in kilometers of what you've traveled um, into the tab of what mode of travel you used, whether you used a car, um, an electric car, a bus, um, if it was an overhaul flight, um, international, and then it will, um, at the end of the tab, will give you how much carbon emissions you've emitted through that. And it's just really a nice tool to actually kind of visualize that a little more and to kind of see the difference it does make because we, we're all seeing like, we'll have to use sustainable travel, we'll have to use active travel, it's so much better. But then what does it really look like, that difference and how big a difference really is it um so you've kind of like I've, I've done a little trial myself where um my family is back over in in munich in germany and i usually fly um so i've punched in kind of like um other options of taking the train or taking just a, an electric car down south and it actually like it, you'd be surprised what a difference it really does make once you see the numbers um, so I would encourage folk to just, even if it's hypotheticals and you just play around with it, it's really, really helpful to get a great understanding of it. Great, thank you. Um, this is a comment here from Rob. There is a good tool online regarding the impact of doing Zoom calls on CO2 emissions. Um, for a second there, I was thinking in terms of negative impact, but I'm assuming Rob is referring to the positive impact. Yeah, so what it does is it, for example, I whacked in 43 people for three hours for this call and it said about a kilo of carbon. But then what it does is it says that's equivalent to driving six miles. So if you then think if all 43 of us were made, meeting face to face and therefore having to all get to a central venue, it's obviously a more efficient way uh, in terms of the climate impacts of carbon than, than doing the face to face. Obviously, there are other benefits of doing face to face versus online, but it's quite a nice little way of calculating it and comparing it and contrasting it. Hmm. That's really interesting, actually. That's, that's a really nice thing to reflect on for a starting event, actually, when you think about the number of yeah. people you've got booked on to share some of those stats and that positive message. Um, well, I, th I think the other thing is people always think that the online stuff is carb, you know, doesn't have an impact, you know. So we all go yeah. home and we sit and watch Netflix and the carbon impact of Netflix is massive, for example, because of the service space. So it's just about being more aware of some of those other things that we kind of just assume are good for the environment, but actually still do have an impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so um, Vanessa, we've got one minute left. Oh, um, goodness, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention to the time at all. I'm just kind of like mesmerized by all the, all the post-it notes that are going around. No, is there, does anyone want to kind of like elaborate on, on one or two things like in, in the little time we've got left, um, anything that jumps out um, and wants to sort of discuss or maybe a call out to see like, oh, I've, I've got this challenge. Is there anyone that can help or has experience with that? Because this is, this is getting a lot of post-it notes now. I think I think I just appeal to people. So it is um, it is now 25 past. So if anybody does want to go off on their uh, tea break now um, and then we'll be back, just you need to you can stay in this Zoom room because you haven't joined the other one. So we'll be starting again at 1230 with the um, panel discussion. So thank you very much um, for everyone that's joined this workshop. And as I say, um, there'll be resources and a screenshot of this emailed out for you because there's some really great ideas, challenges and solutions to, to mull over in terms of linking it back to the other policy and strategy discussions that people have been talking about earlier on and um, to think about that forward look. Um, so 
yeah, so if anyone wants to stay on and ask Vanessa any questions, if not, um, thank you so much, um, Vanessa, for hosting this workshop with us. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, if no one else is staying on, we'll see everyone back here at 12.30. Thank you. OK, great. So welcome back, everybody, from our workshop sessions. And it's now time for the panel. So um, as we all know, we've had Mentimeter running and there's really great questions. So I'm going to use those Mentimeters to pose to the panel. Um, I have said to everyone, feel free, please, to just turn your cameras on now. Um, you don't have to, but obviously, um, or if it doesn't disrupt your service. If panel members can please have their cameras on. Um, for some reason, um, our Zoom room has lost its ability to spotlight the panel members. So if people want to, you can go up to view in the top right hand corner of your screen, click on that. And if you click on speaker view, it will mean whichever panel member is responding will definitely stay up on the screen. But I can see all the panel members here. So just as a wee reminder, our panel members are Lindsay Marson from Chester Zoo, Robert McPhail from the Tarbot Castle Trust, Sylvia Myers from the Natural History Museum, Susan O'Connor, Scottish Civic Trust, Chris Martin from Team Kinetic, Vanessa Glendamere, Responsible Tourism Coordinator from Historic Environment Scotland, and our speakers will also be joined by Rob Jackson and Vanessa Teed. Rob is director of Rob Jackson Consulting Limited. He helps engage and inspire people to bring about change. Rob has more than 27 years of experience working in the voluntary and community centre, holding a variety of strategic development and senior management roles that have focused on leading and engaging volunteers. Vanessa has worked in volunteer management for the last 15 years. The last seven have been with the heritage sector. She is the vice chair of the Heritage Volunteering Group, as well as vice chair to the London Heritage Volunteering Group. And her day job is volunteer and apprenticeship strategy manager at the Natural History Museum. Vanessa, I got that out correctly for the first time over the few events that we've been in together. Yes. Well done. Well done, okay. Rosie. Okay, <laughs> so I'm heading over to Mentimeter now um, as we speak. Um, if someone wants to share the Mentimeter um, link in the chat again, just in case it's got lost, that would be great because you can no. go in and um, just click on the thumbs up icon on the right hand side of the list, which will allow you to vote for your favourite questions that have come through. So one with nine votes. How could we sustain volunteering in rural areas where there is a lack of public transport? So I'll read that out again. How could we sustain volunteering in rural areas where there is a lack of public transport? And I would like to direct that question to Robert, please. A difficult question for me to answer. I, I've already explained, I think, that uh, all of my volunteers uh, already uh, live in the area, live close by, and generally speaking, they can walk to the site uh, we don't bring in volunteers uh, from a, a larger area, uh, except that perhaps we did, We certainly did in our dig, uh, but they just have to find their own way here. Uh, I, I don't really have a solution for that problem. Uh, certainly frequency is difficult uh, of buses, um, but the only volunteer that I have who does live out with the immediate area I do know on a Saturday morning, he comes in uh, with an early morning bus and uh, he makes that his day in Tarbert doing his shopping and volunteering in the morning. OK, thank you, Robert. Is there any other panel members who want to come in and offer any other um, examples related to rural volunteering and public transport? No. Uh, okay. I was gonna, oh, yep. oh, sorry, I was going to say, you know, think about how you could take your what you do in your organisation to the communities. Um, so, you know, the example that I talked about earlier with our new nature recovery corridor project, that's about us taking our work away from the zoo and going out into those communities. Um, and even so much as we've purchased bikes for the staff to actually cycle out to these communities and actually engage with people there as well. So that's the way we could do it on the Miro before you know people were saying don't just be passive about this actually write to MPs and I thought it was a really great solution you know don't just accept that you know 
rural communities are not going to be able to get involved perhaps you know it, we we support volunteers to to speak out about these issues and if, if volunteering is important to them then maybe we need to approach the people that can make a change Okay, thank you. And actually, Lindsay, while you're up here on screen, we have got another question specifically for you. With the Green Travel Reward Scheme that you talked about, what rewards do you offer and which are the best incentives? And that's from Sarah Pierce. Well, so when it was running, so we actually stopped it during COVID because a lot of it was shared to stay, you know, shared type of travel. So we, when we, we, when COVID happened, we sort of stopped the promotion around it. Um, so what it, the way we did it was, it was kind of like, you know, those incentives that you get, if you drink so many coffees, you get a free coffee where you get sort of stamps, or you'd have sort of a card and you'd sort of record, um, you know, if you travel by bike, by bus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you'd be entered into a drawer every month. And it wasn't just for volunteers, it was for staff too. So um, the rewards were things like vouchers, so high street vouchers. Um, but during our strategy work that we've done over the past um, 18 months with volunteers to develop our plan for volunteering, we really asked volunteers how they want to be recognised and thanked. And actually, what volunteers really want is um, kind of more experience led rewards. So when we do introduce this this scheme back again that's the route that we will be going down so they really kind of value that time with curate curators and zookeepers and um, really being immersed in in the, what we offer as a zoo so that's that's what we're going to explore in the future because that's what volunteers tell us is really rewarding for them okay thank you and we've got a comment here from jill um related to travel uh, have more blended activities, enable people to work at home, create activities out in the community using local halls, add heritage voice to the local political environment and have a very accurate knowledge of how many volunteers and staff there are in the heritage sector who need public transport. Um, absolutely, um, it'd be really great to have a collaboration working together mapping that type of information. So back to Mentimeter, I've got a question for Rob. Um, Rob, you work of, across a big range of sectors, of course, yeah. in your volunteerism profession. So what would you consider um, the first thing that all of us could do after today's session in terms of thinking about the contribution that volunteering can make to climate impact? Uh, I, I think one of the first things that I would do, and I'm, I'm happy to come in quickly with some thoughts on the rural thing in a second as well, if you want me to, Rosie. Um, I, I, I think the first thing is we need to make sure within our organisations that volunteers and volunteering is being factored into our organisations thinking around climate action. Uh, in the workshop that I was in, I, I, I put a thing in the um, in the kind of the digital whiteboard around actually we need to make sure that volunteering is integrated within our organisations thinking on climate action. If we just concentrate, which we can do sometimes, just on the volunteering side of things, then we will have impact but it will be separating what volunteers can do out from the rest of the organization. And I think there's real advantages to, to mainstreaming volunteering within this agenda, partly because all our organizations have way more volunteers than they do paid staff, if indeed they have any paid staff. So there's more advocates for the climate uh, agenda, but there's also more people who can make an impact as a consequence of that. Um, but also because there's more people and hopefully there's a growing diversity of those people, there's a fantastic talent pool of ideas and thoughts and new new ways of working that are much bigger than just the paid staff. You know, as paid staff, we don't have all the answers, do we? So I think it, the more we can take kind of concrete steps to start building volunteering into that agenda within our organisations or pushing our organisations to adopt this agenda because volunteers take it seriously, I think is a really positive thing. Very quickly on the rural thing, I think a couple of quick things to, to, to consider. Um, obviously, one of the things to challenge is with rural areas is quite often very rural areas are also the same areas that have poor internet connectivity. So that raises an additional challenge. The second one is we tend to just kind of lump all rural areas in together. Some rural areas are better served than other rural areas. Some have quite small communities, some have quite big communities. And I, I think the third thing I'd highlight in there is um, rural communities aren't static, no community is static. And one of the things that we've seen in the last 18 months is a lot of people moving out of urban areas into rural areas as a consequence of the pandemic and wanting to change their lifestyle and, and their exposure to COVID, for example. And that's changed the population makeup of rural areas, which then raises all kinds of opportunities for volunteering 
in those communities as well, not only around the climate agenda, but around other ways. So I think it's important that we don't consider these to be homogenous and static communities, but actually understand how they're dynamic and changing. Okay. Thank you. Um, some really great points there for us to reflect on. I've got a question for Susan. Do we think policies, <clears throat> excuse me, do we think policies and strategies within governments will recognise the contribution volunteering can bring to the climate challenge? That's kind of an interesting one, Rosie, actually. Um, and I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion. Um, we have our own lecture series at the moment, which is looking at the intersection between the equity, the climate crisis and heritage. Um, and we're doing uh, lectures every second day during COP. And my, my last, my own one is the last one in the series, which is out Friday, this day week, actually. Um, and it looks at, at the idea of how there is a kind of a, a middle class assumption that all we have to do is take personal action rather than looking at uh, structural change. Um, and I think really we have to be focused on that. Um, I don't see much evidence of incorporation of those kind of values into volunteering. And it's particularly, it seems to be added on rather than integral. Um, much like we've seen other things become uh, added on before they become fully integrated. So we might look at diversity as well in terms of the strategies and policies in relation to volunteering and diversity. It's much the same. And I know that's why Make Your Mark is there to try and tackle that. But I think it's it's kind of that root and branch approach that we need to take to the climate crisis. Um, we have to think of volunteering in relation to the climate crisis rather than the climate crisis in relation to volunteering. And that does require a full rethink. And I don't see it happening right now. Something definitely for us to mull over in an advocacy sense with Make Your Mark, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So a question for Sylvia. When educating about climate change, do you pitch it as a present future issue or do you also tie it to historic climate change um, which could be a clear link to heritage missions and um, well I think it has to be sort of taught as a, a very current thing because it's happening now um, in my world obviously out in the wildlife garden um, with living things um, but kind of looking into uh, the wider museum uh, then um, we do try and encourage volunteers to go to some of the life sciences uh lectures where you will end up with these with these links to what can we learn from the fossil record um about climate change in the past and how has it affected things or like from past mass extinctions um and trying to get the volunteers involved it's kind of looking towards the wider museum and kind of looking looking back in the lessons um and it's kind of it's, it's in the whole building as well which is quite interesting at the museum because one side is um, of the beautiful waterhouse building. One side is all animals, which when it was built were extinct. And one side is um, things which are living or were living. Um, and, and there's one thing on the extinct side, which has been turned out to be alive, but one thing on the other side, which has turned out to be, which has now become extinct. And as, you know, as climate change happens, um, we might end up having to cross off more of those actual very physical casts on the building um, as more of them become become extinct. Um, that's a very powerful thought, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, that's like written in the stone building. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, so next up, we've got a question for Chris. Um, Chris, how do you ensure beneficial volunteer organization relationships develop for those who are micro volunteering that was off, off mute um, it's a good question i think when you are looking at micro volunteering that that the key thing is making sure you get that return on investment as an organization so it's it's creating opportunities that are um that you that you can make easily accessible and inclusive and open to people without necessarily being a massive undertaking for you as an organization. So you want to create opportunities that are uh, interesting and uh, as, as Susan talked about earlier, bite-sized and, and manageable um, that, that don't necessarily uh, overwhelm you as a volunteer manager, I guess is what I'm saying. So. Uh, 
I'm not quite sure I've answered the question, but I guess that's what we're saying. You want a, a really interesting offer, a broad offer that is accessible to as many people as possible when you're looking at that micro op op opportunities that uh, people can get involved with it without necessarily having to overwhelm the volunteer manager to create those things in the first instance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, question for um, Vanessa G. How can we make sure everyone feels responsible for taking climate action rather than relying on someone else is going to fix it? That is an exceptionally great question. Um, I think um, earlier on, this came, this came up in our workshop and earlier on, um, someone was um, proposing to kind of highlight to everyone what our impact is. And I think I've also seen another post-it note on, on the middle board talking about when we, when we talk about climate change, climate action, it can be quite doom and gloom. And I think also with trying to get people on board and trying to see their responsibilities within driving change, um, we have to be careful on how we communicate that, how we, how we bring them on board um, in terms of highlighting the impact and maybe say like, well, instead of just going out and being like, oh, if you throw this to landfill, this is going to have this carbon footprint and it's bad. Instead, offer them sort of alternatives and solutions for it and be like, oh, don't throw it away, compost it instead. And that's how you save a certain amount of emissions. So it's, well, I think if, if we try to turn it into a, or concentrate on the positive impact that the change and the responsibility can bring with it, rather than focus on saying like, oh, the way you're doing it is bad right now and this, this is why. Um, I think that that might be a, a nicer and gentler and certainly has um, has worked for, for us in, as an organization, I think at HES as well, um, to, to bring people on board and to, to bring them onto that messaging. Um, so I think like, there's no one size fits all, um, I guess, and we're, we're all different. We'll all see um, different priorities in life. Um, but I think overall, if we if we try and concentrate on the positives that they are, that, that come with the change and with changing our habits, changing the behavior, then um, that, that might be a good way forward. Okay, thank you. And then we've just got one last quick question for Rob. How do you ensure quality of input without training? For example, thinking about heritage-based tasks, if asking people to complete some wording or taking photos for the National Archive. Um, and we're just about to hit um, the end of the panel session, so you've got about 30 seconds, Rob. <laughs> Me? 30 seconds? Never. Um, I'm guessing this is related to the kind of micro-volunteering stuff. I think it's really important, uh, regardless of whether training is involved or not, to have really clear guidelines. It doesn't take much to just put some simple instructions up on a website or in a downloadable document or in a Google Drive that says, you know, photos must be taken in landscape, for example, or a particular resolution or whatever it may be. Really simple, you know, back of a fag packet, almost as we used to say, instructions that explain what the process is and what it is that you want people to do. And it's really easy to engage with, kind of distill it down to the essentials. OK, great. Thank you very much, Rob. And thank you so much to all of our um, panel members there. And also have a wee look in the chat. Erin's posted some great resources and links uh, for us related to some of those topics that were just discussed. So we're gonna move on now to our last speaker and that is Erin Burke, who will be giving us an overview of the benefits to Make Your Mark and how you can recruit volunteers online through our volunteer portal. Erin is the communications officer for Make Your Mark campaign and one of the co-organizers of today's event. They've been in post since January 2020 and in that time have built up the campaign's membership to include 50 plus Scottish heritage organisations. Erin also works for the Scottish Civic Trust, where they manage their communications and spreadsheets, uh, spearhead, sorry, not spreadsheets, spearheads, their strategy to address, address racism against people of colour. She's previously worked as a volunteer organiser at Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum and Glasgow Doors Open Day Festival. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, Rosie. Can I just check that everyone can hear me and that you can see my screen, if you could just give me a thumbs up? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. So as Rosie said, I'm Erin Burke and I'm the Make Your Mark Communications Officer. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to give you a brief overview of Make Your Mark and also how we can support volunteer involving heritage organizations in Scotland. 
Make Your Mark is a campaign that aims to increase the number and diversity of heritage volunteers in Scotland. The campaign is led by a partnership of national stakeholders in Scotland's heritage and voluntary sectors. So you can see these partners along the bottom of your screen here. So who can join Make Your Mark? Any organization in Scotland that celebrates and preserves history or culture, as well as involves volunteers or would like to involve volunteers can join Make Your Mark, including public, private, charitable, and other entities. We welcome organizations that work with the natural and built environment, organizations that preserve and celebrate intangible heritage, volunteer-led organizations, civic trusts, local heritage and history groups, museums and galleries, historic houses and castles, libraries and archives, buildings and monuments, development trust associations, and more. So why should your organization join Make Your Mark? Make Your Mark supports volunteer involving heritage organizations in Scotland in a few key ways. Firstly, by connecting heritage volunteer coordinators across Scotland to a peer-to-peer -peer volunteer organizers network. This network responds to queries about volunteer management practice and also organizes events that share best practice in inclusive volunteer management. For example, recent events have shared tips for involving refugee volunteers, engaging with non-screen users, and safely welcoming back volunteers during COVID-19. The campaign also shares inclusive volunteering practice. This is done through the campaign social media at Vol Organizers and also through a regular e-newsletter that shares the latest in volunteer management and inclusive heritage practice. And finally, Make Your Mark will promote heritage volunteering opportunities to new and underrepresented audiences. I'll just go into a little bit more detail about how exactly we can help you recruit volunteers. Make Your Mark has resources to help you recruit online, in person, and also via partnerships. For online recruitment, we just launched a Scottish Heritage Volunteer Portal for organizations to advertise their volunteering opportunities. So you can see a screenshot of the portal here with an opportunity added by the Linlithgow Civic Trust. The portal is free for Make Your Mark members and also easy to use. So you just create an account and then you fill out a simple form that asks for details about your opportunity. We've also worked with Team Kinetic, creators of the portal and also one of our workshop leaders today to create tutorials to help you get started. For in-person recruitment, we've developed branding and graphics to create flyers and posters. And we also provide inclusive communication and design tips so that your flyers and posters can reach as many potential volunteers as possible. And finally, we support you to recruit volunteers by signposting you to relevant community groups and equality, diversity, and inclusion organizations. Partnering with organizations that already reach your target audience is the most effective way to diversify your volunteer program. These organizations may offer to advise you on how to tailor your volunteer roles to their audiences or members, and or they may offer to circulate your opportunities to their audiences. So for example, if you're interested in recruiting more refugee volunteers, you may consider reaching out to a local refugee support group. To help you identify potential partners, we've created a list of over 100 community groups and equality, diversity, and inclusion organizations across Scotland. So if your organization is interested in joining Make Your Mark to access all of the resources and support that we have to offer, you can join us for free by filling out our expression of commitment to inclusive volunteering, which is found on our website at makeyourmark.scot. Thanks for your time today, and I'll hand it back over to Rosie now to wrap us up. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, yes, I'm without Erin. Make Your Mark wouldn't be here uh, where it is today. So thank you so much, Aaron, for all your hard work that you do with us. So I'm conscious that I'm standing between all of us and our lunches. So I'm going to bring this event to a close now. Thank you so much for a great morning of discussion. Yet again, this is an event where we're hearing shared themes around organisational and community resilience, adaption, collaboration, support, and quite frankly, a love for each other and volunteering. A clear message from today is that we can all do so much to influence behaviours beyond our doorstep if you want to. Through the wider work we do and the interactions that we have, it's not a coincidence that collaboration was a core theme throughout the presentations today. All sectors can work together to support each other and the people they support and both rural and urban communities have a responsibility to embrace an action-orientated response. 
No one should make assumptions on the other, but think creatively together. Climate change is a very big and complex picture. We're all learning about it all the time. We need to ensure that we explore the balance of projects and other important aspects. For example, projects are finding that funding applications are welcome related to addressing climate impact, but that should not become a focus in place of other activity that can bring long-term positive impacts as we head out of the pandemic. I feel that important takeaway is that we can all reflect that the many activities we engage with through volunteering either are or can become interlinked with project planning to mitigate climate impact. So much can be achieved locally. Everyone talked about educating visitors about climate change and its impact on cultural and heritage sites. Robert talked about improving accessibility to increasing visitors and in doing so, in increasing contributions to the local economy, economy, showing that the Tarbert Castle Trust is building wider community resilience in the face of climate action. Respect the intrinsic value of what is around us from the tiniest creatures to the biggest trees and oceans and ensure your volunteers understand that everything they look after and what they do has value in the climate emergency. And on a personal note, for us all, some simple yet crucial actions from all of our speakers and workshop presenters. Reduce energy, use renewable energy, save water, use local products, encourage low carbon travel, use, uh, use reused or waste materials, reduce waste, reuse plastics, spread the word and ditch the disposables. So I hope you've enjoyed this event. and I would like to thank everyone who has made this happen. Our incredible speakers, workshop presenters and panel members, members Gemma, Robert, Lindsay, Sylvia, Susan, Erin, Vanessa, Chris, Rob, and another Vanessa. My fellow event team members, Vanessa, Erin, Susan, Catherine, Joe, Rebecca, Chris, and our Community Connections Forum tech extraordinaire, Rosie B. A recording of today will be uploaded to the Make Your Mark website in due course, and digital feedback form that will take five minutes will be emailed to you after the event. It would really be appreciated if you could take the time to complete it so that we'll know if you are keen for us to deliver more events like this. And that just brings me to say thank you and bye for now. <laughs>